Yes, we can. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. My name is Nahid Nagizadeh from Senesta, Iran. It is my pleasure to be with you in this virtual workshop. And I would like to welcome you all to this event to the rangelands and pastoralism in Asia. We are here to hear the tales and inspiring stories of coexistence of pastoralists in harmony with nature based on their customary governance systems. We all know around half of the earth land surface is rangelands and rangelands play an essential role supporting the livelihoods of millions of peoples around the world and contribute to food security and provide many ecosystem services and climate regulations. And we appreciate that mobile pastoralism is the most viable and resilient form of production and land use in the fragile drylands. And they have adopted a seasonal migration lifestyle in their ancestral territories in order to increase their resilience to natural challenges and simultaneously to sustain natural resources. As the late, Dr. Farber, our leader said, and regularly noted the migratory practices of indigenous peoples are almost de facto nature conservation strategies. Yes, that's the reality. Seasonal migration represents a shared sense of solidarity and respect for nature, territory, and strong social institutions of pastoralists in conservation of nature. Today, we are here to establish a an Asia-wide learning network on rangelands and pastoralism, particularly in relation to indigenous community conserved areas and territories and territories of lives, and to promote the International Year for Rangelands and Pastoralism of 2026. And we will focusing on sharing experiences of best practices and key challenges on rangelands and pastoral communities, territories of life across Asia, and we will declare our support for the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralism. And we will determine key topics, format, and timing for follow-up events on rangelands and pastoralists across Asia and commemorate the life, work, and vision of Dr. Mohammad Tari Farwa, our great and memorable leader at Senesta and honorary leader and chair of the ICCA Consortium. During this event, all of us will contribute toward the planning of a series of workshops in Asia to further advance the objectives of this event and enhance enabling environments that promote and strengthen the territories of life and international year for rangelands and pastoralists at various levels. For your more information, I would like to share the main session of our today's event and the housekeeping rules for your kind consideration during the event. Next slide, please. Yeah. During this event, please use the chat function to the Zoom to introduce yourself, your name and your organization name, and write any question or feedback. In plenary session, if you would like to speak, please use raise hand, then, the moderate will give you the floor to speak and please use raise, uh, deselect your raise hand when you finished your statement. And please keep a statement brief and to the point due to short time we have. Next slide, please. As you see in the next slide, there are other functions that are identified by numbers from one to seven which you can mute or unmute your microphone, start or stop your camera and view list of participants or use the chat box. And importantly, with number six, you can choose the interpretation language. And finally, with number seven, you can raise your hand and request the floor. And the main session of our two days event are divided in seven parts. The first part is welcoming notes presentations of the event's objectives and housekeeping goals and the agenda. The second part will be dedicated to opening remarks for representatives of our co-hosting organizations from ICCA Consortium 
and member of Global Coordination Group of International Year for Rangelands and Pastoralists, and from UNDP Jeff SGP Global Support Initiative Program. And we will have a video message to commemorate Dr. Farma Tarif Sarah. Then we will have the keynote speech from ICCA Consortium. And the fourth session will be about the country and regional overview presentations from seven Asian regions from China, Inner Mongolia, Tibetan, Plateau, Mongolia, India, Iran, and Kyrgyzstan. And we will also display two video messages between presentations. The next part will be presentations on activities of regional international support groups of international <coughs> year from Central Asia and Mongolia, South Asia, and the Middle East and North Africa. <coughs> and the, then we will have the plenary session with question and answer and plenary on topics and format of the follow-up events on rangelands and pastoralists in Asia, accompanied with a video message from China on, and its pastoralists. And finally, the closing session will be our consensus, and our joint message from the event in support of the International Year for Rangelands and Pastoralists and Territories of Lives. And then we will have the closing remarks. <coughs> This workshop is co-hosted by ICCA Consortium, the ICCA Global Support Initiative, and Jeff SGP Program of the UNDP, and collaboration of regional, international year for rangelands and pastoralist support groups from East Asia, South Asia, Middle East, and Central Asia, and Mongolia. Today, we are pleased to welcome to three special guests from co-hosts of the event for the opening remarks. I would like to invite Ms. Holly Jones, the Global Coordinator of the ICCA Consortium, one of the host organizations of the event. The floor is yours, Ms. Holly. Thank you, Nahid Jun. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, great. Hi, everyone. It's, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. Wonderful to see such a large group joining for this crucial uh, event today. It's, it's a very exciting event. And I think it's, it's particularly important for us in the ICCA consortium uh, because today holds a lot of weight for us. Uh, the 16th of July is the date that our co-founder and motivator in chief, uh, Tagi Farvar passed away in 2018. So this day, holds weight in that regard it's sometimes full of sadness and sense of loss of Tagi but also this is an opportunity to celebrate his legacy and continue his life's work with all of you and it's really an honor to be with you today uh, on behalf of the ICCA consortium and I'd really like to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us I'd especially like to thank our uh, friends and colleagues who have helped organize this, particularly our regional coordinators, several of our members, uh, partners and friends from the regional support groups and, and so on. So yes, we're, we're just really thrilled to be with you today and to have the opportunity to begin another uh, cycle of uh, an initiative that I think will uh, stand the test of time in that pastoralism uh, continues over many, many, many, many uh, centuries and millennia. And we hope that the initiative that will begin today uh, with a series of workshops and events and, and efforts at the local level as well uh, will be an important contribution to Indigenous peoples and local communities who are governing and conserving their collective lands and territories across the Asian continent. So again, huge thanks for being here today. I'm really looking forward to listening and learning from all of you. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Nahid, back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Holly, for your valuable remarks. Our second special guest is Mr. Jorgen Hopp, member of the Global Coordination Group for International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. Mr. Jorgen, you have the floor, please.
Thank you, Nahim. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Hijaba Ikambai, for, for having me be part of this event. Uh, many thanks for the invitation to make the opening remarks in, in this very important workshop on pastoral communities, territories of life in grasslands and rangelands across Eurasia. Recently, in the the Territories of Life 2021 report produced by the Consortium for Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas, five key messages were identified. One is that Indigenous peoples and local communities play an outsized role in the conservation and sustainable use of the world's nature. Secondly, they make extensive contributions to a healthy planet and that are rooted in their cultures and collective lands and territories. Uh, moreover, they are custodians of many and frequently most of the natural areas of the world. Fourthly, they are on the front lines of resisting the main industrial drivers of global biodiversity loss and climate breakdown. And lastly, even in the face of immense threats, indigenous peoples and local communities have extraordinary resilience and determination to maintain the integrity of their territories, but then also areas where they continue to persist in the pursuit of self-determination, self-governance, peace, and sustainability. These five findings resonate deep in Mexico's rainforest, way up in the North in the Norwegian high Arctic, or south in, in the desert areas of South Africa. I would be no, not surprised if this is in fact the common denominator for local communities and indigenous people around the world. Our friend Taghi, Dr. Mohammed Taghi Farvar from Iran brought it up quite clearly already in 2008, as we met in Inner Mongolia and together with other colleagues and friends, we wrote the Hohot Declaration just prior to the Joint International Grasslands and Rangelands Congress, the first time that these two Congresses came together. And he stated quite clearly, and it was already put imprinted in the declaration, he said, we recognize the importance of strengthening indigenous territories, community conserved areas, and the establishment of new protected areas, and that one of the most important opportunities for collaboration is ensuring worldwide societal recognition of the enduring value of natural grasslands. This led in part to the birth of precisely what we now have in our uh, about to, to, to uh, accomplish together, the designation of the International Year of Rangeland and Pastoralists. More recently, the late Ganimat Ashdari, from, also from Iran, from uh, the Kashkai tribe, said in a meeting of the Convention of Biodiversity, she said, if you care about nature and biodiversity, indigenous peoples and local communities are your biggest allies. No one knows our territories better than we do. No one has a bigger stake in protecting and securing our territories and the life within them than we do. Recognition of local communities and indigenous rights is of paramount importance, a message that this world urgently needs to understand and acknowledge. I celebrate, I celebrate, therefore, that this is part of the goals of your meeting, and I wish you all the best in moving forward with this high mission. Be also aware that many other co local communities and indigenous groups are paying attention to what you are saying. In fact, yesterday, I had a conversation with pastoralists from South America, and they are very keen in mapping their territories, a work where the ICA consortium has also built very important experience. Hence, here is one more opportunity where we hope the International Year of Rangelands and Pastures can help you achieve two things. One is make the world aware of the importance of rangelands, natural grasslands, and particularly the role of pastoralists as stewards of the land. Secondly, promote the exchange of successful experiences among local communities with indigenous groups to expedite and consolidate the recognition of the rights, your rights as pastoralists. We salute you, wish you all the best in your meeting and look forward to learning from you and the outcomes of this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jorgan, for focusing on territories of life and the specific ecological and socioeconomic values and characteristics of indigenous peoples and pastoralists and local communities in conservation of nature. And also thank you for remembering our dear leader, Dr. Farwar, and our dear sister and colleague, Ajdari. 
May they soul rest in peace. Thank you so much. Our third special guest is Mr. Terence Saidi from UNDP Jeff SGP and Global Support Initiative. Dr. Terence, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Nahid uh, June, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to start by uh, remembering um, four years ago um, when we met uh, in Kyrgyzstan for the workshop um, for Western Central Asia. Um, the picture behind me is taken from Songkul Lake, the, the summer lake, uh, high pasture um, in high altitude Kyrgyzstan. Um, this was, the, I think, the last time that um, I, I saw Tagi, um, and I think he would be very pleased that we're all meeting um, here today to discuss this very important topic. Um, it's a personal pleasure for me to be um, involved in this uh, network uh, focusing on grasslands in, in Asia. Um, some of my university career research was uh, looking at, at the uh, phenomenon of uh, nomadic uh, ger settlements in Ulaanbaatar in the 1990s. And so I spent a lot of my career studying the forms of uh, Mongolian gears compared to Kyrgyz gears. Um, many of the points have already been made about the relevance of 2026 as the International Year of Rangelands. I would um, add to that that the, the UN decade on uh, ecosystem restoration has now officially been launched last month in, in June. And um, there are obviously very many connections between uh, ecosystem restoration and rangelands. And so I see a great opportunity to uh, deepen the, um, the emphasis of territories of life for um, both rangelands and ecosystem restoration. And then um, from our side in, in UNDP and the, the small grants program, uh, we are now entering a, an eighth replenishment cycle of, of the GEF. Um, and uh, at this, which will conclude next year in, in June. And one of the um, suggestions is to really focus on um, traditional knowledge and, and ecosystem restoration through community uh, actions. The new Jeff uh, CEO, um, the first CEO from the Global South, has said that he uh, will follow what he calls the Southern Cross and not the North Star. And, and when he um, and one of his big areas of emphasis is to look at a South-South cooperation or triangular cooperation. So I think this network focusing on, on uh, grasslands in Asia can also be uh, amplified globally and, and uh, from the perspective of the uh, Small Grants Program and the, the Global ICCA Support Initiative, we uh, look forward to uh, supporting and working with um, the network as it evolves. So thank you very much, uh, Nahid Jun, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Dr. Herons, for your valuable remarks. And uh, thank you for all your support uh, within UNDP Jeff SGP uh, program and global support initiative that enabled the nomadic pastoralist organization to involve and implement lots of projects and actions for uh, conservation of their territories and uh, defend their, over their rights. Okay, the last part of our second session is dedicated for a video on commemorating Dr. Mohammad Tari Farber, our leader. Thanks to Dr. Grazia borini Ferrobel, member of the Council of Elders of the ICCA Consortium for this video. And thanks for over 30 years of her leadership and governance for the conservation of nature and community rights. And I draw your kind attention to this video. I like speaking about Tagi, as you all know. Um, as for me, like for so many of you, he was um, truly a best friend and the inspirer for the work we all did together. Maybe for some of you who haven't met him, uh, it would be good also to highlight that he was an intellectual, that he was an activist, that um, 
he truly dedicated his work to big ideas and the connections with people that make those ideas alive. So I would like to recall three main movements that really were led from within uh, by Tagi together with others. And then tell you what united those movements, at least in my, in my perspective. Um, the first movement was the one um, that in the 60s and 70s started a very important critical analysis of so-called development of the large scale um, enterprises that went under the name of development and were supposed to be absolutely positive no matter what. Well, Tagi did his uh, PhD research under the guidance of Barry Commoner in the 60s and 70s. He actually did it on the uh, pesticide residues in mother's milk uh, in plantation workers in Guatemala. And um, he was one of the first to really point at something that now uh, we all see more clearly, that there are all these undesired consequences of these major scale development enterprises in terms of the environment, in terms of health and social consequences. And um, the volume that he worked on together with, with others, but he uh, was the chief uh, editor of, is called the Careless Technology, Ecology and International Development. That volume really opened the eyes of many people, me included. Uh, at that time, I did not know Dagi, but I read a uh, good part of this uh, volume. So it was at the time in which there was an arrogant sense of presumptions, uh, presumptuousness. Uh, we are developing, we are going ahead. And, uh, and Tagi and many others uh, in uh, the UN uh, Stockholm Conference of 72 and in the Rio Conference on Environment and Development of 92, truly pointed at the fact that we were also losing a lot, not only making uh, big gains, and we should be stopping being only arrogant and presumptuous. Um, of course, he managed to influence generations of thinkers, but also to make lots of enemies. And um, it was at that time that I think he learned to speak without, without fear, ever. Um, in fact, he also went through the civil rights movement in the United States. He was there because, as you know, he was born in Iran, but uh, he was in the US for his studies. And there uh, he participated in the civil rights movements and demonstration was beaten. Um, really, he had the two full uh, adventures uh, life of the, those years. After his studies, he went back to Iran, and in Iran, he um, helped uh, found the Department of uh, the Environment, and also um, what is now one of the oldest and most experienced NGOs in Iran for issues of environment and development, which is uh, Senesta, uh, that is, um, yeah, the, the major visible um, representation of what he has done uh, in Iran. And in fact, with Senesta, he started this second movement that I would like to talk to you about, which is the one to foster the respect and the recognition of the unique ways of life, unique wisdom of mobile indigenous peoples. Tagi fought to recognize the rights of mobile indigenous peoples to remain mobile, to um, maintain those capacities, skills, and the wisdom that allow people to be in a non-destructive and often a beneficial positive relationship with very difficult semi-arid and arid environments that are far from conditions of equilibrium and can only be dealt with in in the in the flexible um, skills and capacities of mobility. Um, Tagi 
did so um, by demonstrating uh, things not only in Iran but in other countries and by participating and, uh, and leading international movements for the recognition of these beneficial results of mobility. Um, just to, to tell you a few, I mean, he participated in the development of the Dana Declaration in 2002. And then in 2003, we started uh, working together for the World Pars Congress in um, Durban, where we uh, managed to pull together the very first gathering of uh, mobile indigenous peoples from very many regions who could present their case in front of the World Park, Con Parks Congress. In that occasion, he also created the World Alliance of Mobile Indigenous Peoples, um, uh, for which he served as uh, the first uh, Secretary General. This uh, WAMIP, World Alliance, uh, participated in uh, uh, meetings and uh, conference of the parties of the CBD, and the IUCN, where uh, Tagi was uh, um, chair of one of the key commission, the Commission on Environmental, Economic and Social Policies, and brought um, those instances there in CBDs, in IUCN. And um, uh, of course, you may imagine that uh, international policy influence is made only of glamorous events uh, in international arena, but this was not uh, so at all. While in Iran, Taghi truly uh, had to face plenty of difficulties. Initially under the Shah, he was persecuted, he was blacklisted, he was threatened, he was um, impeded to leave the country for many years, and even impeded to work inside the country because he was considered to work in a too participatory way. Uh, he managed to, at uh, a certain point, to leave and go to work in Sudan with mobile indigenous peoples there. And um, uh, when uh, the um, uh, regime of the Shah fell, he went back to Iran. And even there, under the Islamic Revolution, he was jailed. He was jailed because he had advocated for autonomy for some Kurdish uh, mobile tribes in the Zagros Mountains. So the, the, the hardship was not only political, it was also economic. While in Iran, out of jail, he managed to organize a major conference on nomadism and development with Senesa. And um, the government had promised to provide the resources for the conference, but then they didn't. So Senesta had advanced the resources and for years they had to um, scrap the, the bottom of the barrel just to pay for what not, was not being paid back to them. Um, let me now talk about the third movement that Tagi really led from within, and it is the movement for the appropriate recognition and support to what we call today territories of life, which are the, the territories and the areas that are governed, managed and conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities throughout the world. Now, we call them at the beginning community conserved areas, then ICCA is indigenous and, and community conserved areas. The, the term that I prefer really is territories of life. And uh, Tagi was truly instrumental to pull this phenomenon to the attention of international uh, policy and national policy as well. And he did so as a, a three times elected president of the ICCA consortium, which is one, I understand, of the many organizers of your conference. And, uh, and I'm sure you uh, will hear about this from Holly and Hugo and many others. Now, what Tagi did in the movement was really to call uh, attention to the strong bond, the ties that connect uh, communities, indigenous, pe indigenous peoples and communities to their territories. It is 
a, a tie that is not only made of rights. It is made of uh, wisdom, it is made of knowledge, capacities to govern and manage the institutions that really have been tried and, uh, and tested throughout so many years. And it is made of collective responsibility, not only collective rights. And if I can pass on something to you from him in terms of the uh, ICCA consortium focus, I would like to say that, uh, yes, you may want to focus on collective rights, but also, please, on collective responsibilities. Um, what is the, the link between these three movements that I mentioned to you? In, in my understanding, it is the allegiance that Tagi really felt very deeply, the, the respect, the passion, he had for the wisdom and the multiple values of traditional human community. All his life, he worked and found amazing pleasure in working with traditional communities all over the world, in, in Africa, in, in Asia, in Latin America, in Europe. And um, what he did was to be with them before providing any any advice any any leadership on about anything he truly focused on organizing people but for what they themselves considered good and important to achieve in their lives what he would highlight and strengthen is the sense of their accomplishment yes communities are not perfect change may be desired, but change should be coming from within, as Tagi always stressed, not be imposed from outside. And this is nowhere better represented than in Iran with the Uni Nomad and Uni Kamel, which are a federation of mobile indigenous pastoralists that are um, active and thank goodness still active uh, well after Tagi left the planet for their own self-understanding and their own self-determination uh, in the country and for better policies to support them. I talked about the traditional communities, but we should not forget that he was also um, helping Iran to develop his first department of the environment, or he helped found a couple of universities, including the Avicenna University in Iran, where he was vice rector for a while. He also uh, participated in, in writing and wrote many um, important uh, work that are left for him, from him. Um, what possibly many of us will remember above and beyond everything, his, his, uh, his lifestyle. Uh, he was exclusively vegetarian. He was always barefoot in attitude, but also in lack of shoes. And personally, he was uh, non-violent, absolutely non-competitive. And possibly this is uh, uh, the reason why he never received an award, despite all the things he managed to do in his life. And uh, in fact, if I well remember, he even forgot to ask for reimbursement after he had advanced things, including for travel, because he was always ahead. He was always thinking about new uh, ideas and new things to do, not, not really caring about um, himself. If I, if I have to pull it together into a few words, I would say that Tagi was in, in one, the wisest person you probably have ever met, the person able to say the perfect word at the perfect time, and a child able to irritate you, able to really not do what he needs to be doing at that uh, time. And uh, like the wisest person, like a child, the most lovable person you, you can think of. I hope you feel you all feel in this uh, meeting that he is with you and is proud of you and uh, i'm sure he's wishing to all of you the best in your work um, 
I do it too. And uh, I hope you have a very successful conference. All the best. Again, we thank Dr. Grazia Borini and thank you for your attention to this video, which was a rich summary of valuable efforts and struggles and established movements of Dr. Farwar in defending the rights of indigenous nomadic pastoralists and local communities and indigenous peoples and promoting their role in conservation of nature, conservation of biocultural diversity, and promoting and recognition the territories of life at international and national levels at policy and practice arena. Dr. Farwar is always with us. He is in our heart and we all feel he's encouraging us constantly to support and strengthen the role of indigenous peoples and local communities in conservation of nature and defend their rights over their territories and customary governance systems. By this, I will give the floor to Ms. Holly Jones for the keynote speech. Ms. Holly, the floor is yours, thank you. Hi again, everyone. Uh, I will actually keep off my video just to make sure the connection's okay, but I'm very much here. So thank you again for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor really to, to share some remarks on behalf of the ICC Consortium. As you know, today's workshop focuses on pastoral communities, territories of life in Asia, and interwoven within this topic are countless tales of coexistence of nature and people. Our workshop today will take Let's all be known in this workshop. It'll take us on a journey from Asia through Central Asia, onwards to South and finally West Asia. In each of these diverse contexts, we will learn about pastoralists and their territories of life, their cultures and identities, their governance systems, knowledge and practices, and their struggles and triumphs. The most important common theme across these diverse contexts is movement. Mobility and flexible adaptation are key strategies for the sustainability of grasslands and especially drylands. These strategies are embedded in the worldviews and the ways of life of mobile pastoralists across the region, including intentional strategies for movement between summering and wintering grounds, and different elevations in their territories, use of particular species in different ways in different seasons, and careful monitoring of the conditions of their territories and their impacts on them. The knowledge systems and practices are as diverse as the people who hold them. So before we get into some country and region specific presentations, I'd like to offer some insights from our new report on territories of life, which was published in May. And Jürgen, you did your homework, obviously, for this session. Thank you for already <laughs> mentioning this. And I'll include some examples from uh, some of the case studies on pastoral peoples in Asia to highlight the key findings. So this report was a very ambitious undertaking. And I acknowledge Grazia, who I think is on the call as well for getting us started with the thinking and the ideas around this all the way back in 2019, along with our, our dear sister and friend Kani Mats Ashtari, who uh, has been mentioned already as, as a, a critical part of the ICC consortium movement as well. So this report included 17 case studies of specific territories of life from around the world of which were from nomadic and pastoral communities. It included six national and sub-regional analyses, including one from Iran, a first ever global spatial analysis on the estimated extent of territories of life, which was co-published with the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center, an executive summary that ties all of these different components together into key findings and recommendations, and all of these elements are hosted on a really beautifully designed multimedia website. 
So I encourage you to check that out um, after this. I'll, I'll share the link to the report website in case you haven't seen it yet. So I'll go through the five key findings of this report. The first key finding is that Indigenous peoples and communities play an outsized role in the governance, conservation, and sustainable use of the world's biodiversity and nature. They're actively protecting and conserving a truly astounding diversity of species, habitats, and ecosystems around the world, providing the basis for clean water and air, as well as healthy food and livelihoods for people far beyond the, ter the territorial boundaries. So some of the examples from pastoral communities in this report include really unique livestock breeds that are particularly well adapted to extreme conditions in which they live, as well as a really powerful coexistence to invoke the theme of our event today, a coexistence with many species that are often the focus of mainstream conservation, such as tigers, and they're often portrayed as in conflict with those species, whereas the opposite is the case. There's also an untold number of plant species that are critical for ecosystem functioning and connectivity that comes across the region are really taken care of actively and intentionally as part of their ways of life. I'm sure our friends from Iran will share about the um, biodiversity registers that they've been developing as well. The second key finding really goes beyond what communities are doing into the how and the why they are contributing to nature and a stable climate. So indigenous peoples and local communities, extensive contributions to a healthy planet are rooted in their cultures and collective lands and territories, essentially rooted in the deep relationships between their identities, their governance systems, and the other species and spiritual beings with whom they coexist. They are also contributing significantly to the world's cultural, linguistic, and tangible and intangible heritage. So one of the really powerful examples, the 2021 report is our member Krapavis in Rajasthan, India, and they shared about the Arans or sacred groves, which are really these meeting points for cultural and spiritual traditions and many species of animals, both domesticated and wild, coming together around these um, meeting points, the, the sacred groves. Yeah? The third key finding, particularly from the global spatial analysis with WCMC, shows that indigenous peoples and local communities are the de facto custodians of many state and privately governed protected and conserved areas. And they are also conserving a significant proportion of lands and nature outside of those protected and conserved areas. However, as I'm sure all of you know us, uh, on this call, the mainstream conservation sector has both a historical and a continuing legacy of contestation for indigenous peoples and communities. In some cases, this is not as bad as in others, but it really hinges on the extent to which their rights, their governance systems, and their ways of life are recognized and supported. This poses both a challenge and an opportunity for future directions of conservation efforts from local to global levels. Now, one example, again, from uh, Rajasthan is the Raika who have been excluded in different ways from the Kumbhalgar forest. And the sort of painful irony, particularly for mobile pastoralists, when they are excluded from protected areas, those protected areas generally have been recognized for their contributions to conservation because the communities have created those landscapes. So when the Kumbhagar forest was designated as a protected area, and the Raika were forcibly excluded, actually the ecosystem and the diversity within it declined because the Raika were not able to continue grazing and uh, taking care of their territory essentially. 
So this just goes to show the crucial need to reform laws and policies and in institutions that affect communities and mobile pastoralists in particular, uh, including around nature conservation, wildlife, food and agriculture, and so on. So as many of you know, in the ICC consortium, we're actively engaging in the UN negotiations on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will effectively determine conservation policy for the next decade. So this is a critical opportunity to advocate for recognition of territories of life within that space. And if you're not yet involved in that, it, we have a really critical window of opportunity to do so. So I, I encourage you to join in that uh, effort. Now, the fourth key finding is that indigenous peoples and local communities are really on the front lines of resisting the main industrial drivers of global biodiversity loss and climate breakdown. They often face retribution and violence for doing so. So along with other challenges, these multiple stressors together can have cumulative and compounded effects on these communities, which in turn pose longer term threats to their lives and their cultures and their resilience. However, as, as we have all seen, I'm sure in many different ways, they continue to resist and respond to these threats in diverse and very powerful ways. So as just one example, you know, industrial threats to mobile pastoralists are many. Uh, linear infrastructure is particularly damaging. So whether it's roads or highways, uh, railway infrastructure, such as what you see here, is particularly damaging because obviously it cuts a straight line uh, through pastoralist territories where they would otherwise be moving on a relatively regular basis. The fifth and final key finding is that even in the face of these immense threats, indigenous peoples and local communities have extraordinary resilience and determination to maintain their dignity as well as the integrity of their territories of life. They are adapting to rapidly changing contexts and they are using diverse strategies to secure their rights and their collective lands and territories of life. Of course, they are facing some setbacks here and there and it is a long, long road ahead for sure, but they have undoubtedly made key advances and they do continue to persist. One of the examples of this, again, as, as Grazia mentioned in her video remarks, is the mobilization of indigenous and community networks, including in Iran. There have been different policy and legal advances nationally and internationally. There are specific cases of resistance against threats and genuinely against all odds. And they're managing to do this because they're coming together they're staying strong in their power in the collective nature of, of their communities and their relationships with their territories. So in closing, I'm not the right person to be saying this, but all of you in the region absolutely know this. Indigenous peoples and local communities throughout this region have powerful stories, sagas even, told over centuries, if not millennia. I really hope that this event today will be like a little oasis in our desert where we can gather together under the watchful gaze of Tagi's twinkling eyes and share tales of coexistence through movement. So thank you for your time and we hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop. Thank you, Holly, again, and thanks for focusing the value of mobility and adaptation strategy and other characteristics of indigenous mobile pastoralists to the illustrative summary of the report on territories of life and wild comprehensible and practical examples. By this, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Menal Tapati from India for moderating the next session on country and regional presentations. Mina, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nahid. Uh, we'll move on with our presentations now. And uh, just before we start, I have two important announcements. Uh, for the presenters, if you could uh, please wrap up in the time allotted to you because uh, we need to really keep time. 
and I will be um, I will be interrupting you uh, a minute before your time is up so that uh, you can conclude. Um, and for the participants, uh, if you have any questions for uh, our speakers, please do address it on the chat box. And uh, either you could write it directly on the chat box or you could personally message uh, the presenter on the chat box and uh, we will ensure that they uh, reply back to you. Um, so without further ado, um, let's move on. And um, our first presenter is Mr. Rawang from China. And uh, uh, he's from the Plateau uh, Nature Conservancy. And uh, over to you, Mr. Rawang. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. I'm going to... Uh, so you guys can see my screen, right? Yes, please. Okay, that's great. All right, uh, this is Avon. It's very nice to meet you guys here. And uh, also it's my pleasure to share this presentation. And uh, yeah, we, I'm from China. And uh, today we have three presenters from China. And uh, mainly we are going to talk about community-based grassland conservation and on the Tibetan plateau in inner Mongolia. And we are from three different uh, uh, organizations. Mm. Yep. Mm. And I'm going to talk about bicultural landscape conservation in the source of the Yellow River. And it's almost in the center of the, on the plateau, Tibetan plateau. And my friend Shi Xiangyin is going to talk about community-based wildlife equatorial and uh, grassland restoration on the Tibetan plateau. And uh, our friend Narongo is going to talk, she's from Mon Inner Mongolia, and she's going to talk about the, um, on the value chain of the grassland animal husbandry. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about bicultural landscape conservation and which is taking place in the source of the Yellow River. And uh, currently I'm working for uh, NGO called Plateau Nature Conservation. And it is that established in 2016. And it is dedicated to conserve by diversity uh, and cultural landscape. And um, mainly it's uh, the form of sacred natural sites uh, to we promote local people and especially indigenous people and uh, local herders and uh, coexistence with the, with the wildlife in, in their areas. And the, the, the place that I'm, what we are going, what we are doing on in the area is on the, in the source of the Yellow River. If you look at this map and um, um, uh, the blue line, that's the Yellow River. And the the source of the you can see this there's uh, there are three lakes and uh, if you look at the, in the middle there's the, the the red line it's called Animachin Sacred Mountain. This is our working area and in this area we as organized uh, four local indigenous people based like he he heard the community organizations uh, in this area as to do the biodiversity conservation and the cultural, uh, cultural assessment and, uh, and doing the conservation work in these areas. And especially the animating area in this middle of the, uh, the, the, the map. And this is for the local people. It's a very important uh, sacred mountain entire Tibetan 17. On the Tibetan plateau, sorry, <laughs> the clock. And, uh, also on this side of this area, also three of these lakes for the local people, it's sacred lakes. And these sacred natural sites, we, we as, a, um, as the working area and we are doing the biodiversity and cultural conservation. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's the conservation in these areas. Um, 
And uh, this is the area we call Anima Chinsia Kulimanta. If you look at these two maps and the two photos and the left side, it is what the local people's understanding of the mount, this sacred mountain. It's for the local people, it's not about the landscape or which is there. It's also their belief and their culture. It's the that in the middle of the, this the mountain deity and the are surrounding them, they are like a different. Uh, local deities and they believe that these deities are protecting them and as they respect and protect these areas so if you look at the right side of the photo of this this map and that's the animachi sacred mountain and this is the location each each mark is the location of this each mountain deities and also these areas for like being sacred mountains for at least 1000 years. And this is, uh, this is also the biggest glacier uh, on the, in the source of the Yellow River. It generates uh, the, the water uh, and to the downstreams of the Yellow River. And it's uh, uh, providing hydro ecological services to the millions of people downstreams of the Yellow River. And also for the, um, Many endemic and uh, endangered species. It is this is these areas become their refuge area. And uh, yeah. And why we choose these sacred nature sites in this area to do the conservation or uh, or, the, or its protection? And uh, in these areas, uh, through thousands and, and it, there's a um, protected area called Sanjiang Nature. Uh, protect Sanjiang Yuan protected area, and a few years ago it's become it's become the Sanjiang Yuan National Park, and also on the local side there's the understanding of these natures. They have uh, sacred nature sites that we call it if you if you wanna do the, the the conservation in these areas. I think it is from apart from the Sanjiang Yuan nature protect um, Sanjiang Yuan protected area and Sanjiang Yuan National Park. We still think. Uh, uh, sacred nature sites is important in these areas as the locals believe that's protecting the these areas and species within areas. Uh, that's the, if you see the, the difference between these forms of uh, protected uh, areas and uh, you can see the difference. I will not talk about each details that I lined here. And uh, also we could, what we are doing now is on this, on this slide and what we are doing the first is doing the assessment, bicultural assessment within these areas, and especially key species uh, assessment. And also we are doing the uh, sec surveys on the sacred mountains and lakes, and and and also this is the the the, the habitat, very important habitat for this many of the key species in these areas. Uh, based on the, our assessment, and then we are with the local government and NGOs, local communities, especially monasteries, we are doing the conservation actions as a, a second step. Thirdly, we are doing the networking with the local NGOs and other interested groups. And we do it in the third, fourth, we doing the lessons that we do in the, um, with the sacred nature sites and disseminate lessons to the other interested groups and other, even to the government, uh, or to the other like uh, interested in the groups, especially researchers and, and others. And also we are doing the more people to engage in this kind of form of the uh, protected areas. We each year organize cultural and biodiversity tour in these areas to, and we each year recruit more people from entire China to do the uh, cultural the biodiversity tour in these areas to understand the well how the sacred nature sites uh, play a very important in, in role in these areas. And you, if you look at these photos, and that's what we are doing, and especially in these areas, we're doing the sacred mountains survey and the snow leopards. And, uh, and uh, until now, we trained 200 local herders engaged our survey and conservation work. And if you look at, at the photo, the, the left side, you can see that that's the very important habitat for the snow leopards. Also, it's a very important sacred mountain to the uh, local people. Um, 
And that's we covered until now covered like oh, 10,000 square kilometers survey in this area. So this is the first time um, they have done such uh, surveys in these areas and to especially to the species like snow leopards. And it's also provided for, as a result of work, it's provided very important scientific data and uh, to the, uh, to the, it's, the management and the conservation in these areas. And also we are promoting cultural values on the biodiversity conservation in this area. And uh, local in the Aza being as a very important source of the uh, uh, the, the water on the uh, on the Yellow River. And uh, there are thousands of rivers in these areas. And uh, that as as then these days, this is these areas are degradating or uh, encountered many environmental problems, as uh, such as like uh, uh, wastes and other like um, yeah constructions and other many threats occur to these areas. So that each year we are uh, doing like culture with the locals. We are doing like spring like water source of the conservation work, with, which is we engage cultural values with the uh, with the the the the the, the, the cons wetland or the water source conservation work also as i mentioned before and we each year we okay and each year we recruit volunteers and more people from other parts of the china to to experience or tour in these areas to understand how local people interact with their nature and how they are doing the, the conservation in these areas. And yeah, that's so much to more people to understand these areas and to support our work. So these photos, as many of you know, like we, as from our survey, and we record like large carnivores and this are like brown, brown bear, lynx and wolves and snow leopards and uh, all the other parts. Also, also, these are the first time recorded in these sacred mountains and sacred lakes. And it's, as a result, it's improve, improve its ecological values in these areas. And more people to understand not only its culture, also ecological values. And the challenges, I think that's the, uh, the most important problems. I think that's the, the being as, uh, very important source of the water on the Yellow River. And it's now it's like the glaciers are retreating very quickly. Each year we're doing the survey or the assessment in these areas and uh, how these, glacier, these glaciers are retreating and also the grassland around these areas are uh, degradating as the impact of the impact of the climate change and how it's impact on local people's livelihood and it's lifestyle and its culture loss also another problems with this so that we are facing is the uh, how local people's relationship with the large carnivores and within this or, or how this culture or the belief systems is uh, is um, playing the role when such conflicts include like human wildlife conflicts especially with the large carnivores and that's what we believe. Conservation in these areas, we on, not only need protected areas and national parks, also we believe uh, sacred nature sites are playing a very important role in these areas. And uh, as the local people, indigenous people believe that's the, uh, that's, that's, they think they have values that they wanna do it for their nature and their environment. So also what we understand sacred nature sites also connecting people and the nature, especially local people, and, uh, and let the understanding in the, the there's a connection. If you and lose these such cultures and you are losing the connection with nature. And uh, yeah, that's what we think sacred nature, sacred nature sites are playing such important role in these areas. And thank you very much. That's my, my, my presentation, yeah. And the next, our friend uh, Naron goes share her her presentation. Yeah, is yeah. Thank you, Mr. Avang. Uh, Ms. Narongo, you can go ahead. Um, 
Ms. Narangu is from the Surya Center for the Study of Ecology in Inner Mongolia's pastoral region. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Narangu. Uh, hi, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Narangra, uh, Narangra Gala. Yeah, I'm the Trua Center. Uh, the Trua Center is the first NGO of Inner, Inner Mongolia province from 2002. Our topic today is the, on the value chain of grassland animal husbandry. Yeah, Trio Center uh, for the Study of Ecmo Ecology in, in um, Inner Mongolia. Yes, ne next part. Yeah, this one. Uh, this paper, uh, this paper analyzed the current social and economic challenges experienced by herder people arising out of changes to the grassland property rights system. Uh, this paper based on a review of the literature of grassland animal husbandry and the data obtained from a sample survey of pastoral households in 12 typical Inner Mongolia in, uh, herder communities. The analysis focuses on the perspectives of the grassland animal husbandry's value chain, concentrating on its impact on capital, technology, and taxation, and how these affect the livelihood of pure animal husbandry pastoralists in Inner Mongolia. Next one, please. Mm, the study makes an important contribution to the literature in the following area. Firstly, each link of the value chain impacts negative, negatively on the income of the herders. Let me, uh, let me, let me exchange, uh, explain this uh, pie chart. Uh, the technical monopoly is 14,000 yuan and the capital is 14,000 yuan. Taxation is 10,000 10, yuan. The profit is only 10, Thousand yuan. That means uh, the profit is only uh, only less than twenty percent of their income. Next one, please. Mm, secondly, the animal husbandry economy has become more vulnerable as a result of unpredictable precipitation and changes to the grassland property rights system, which has reduced the grazing range of animals due to declaring access to fresh pasture. The picture one is the, uh, is the, oh, the, the, the, the herder uh, by the feedstock uh, the second picture is the, the sheep fold. They, they feed in the sheep fold, uh, not, not like before they, the, the sheep can eat fresh uh, grass uh, on the grassland. Next one, please. The ne next part, please, yeah. Uh, this herder and animal mo mobility constraint prevents animals as accessing new pastures, forcing herders to borrow money to purchase feedstock, making them economically vulnerable and facing large debts. And this picture showed the, showed the environment is bad, than, the worse than, than before. Yeah, the next one, please. Thirdly, these property rights have broken down traditional social networks and norms, which facilitated herbs, uh, herders to cooperate in times of hardship, in particularly periods of drought. Uh, two pictures, the first picture showed in traditionally, uh, traditional uh, social networks, 
uh, people change to uh, from one place to an, to other place on the way they when they meet uh, other uh, herders uh, they are very friendly if they are hungry they can get food from other uh, herders uh, the second picture showed the the the west part of the inner Mongolia. It's very dry. Okay, next one, please. Uh, these three factors potentially pose serious challenges to the food safety of the region. And it's public health, the environment, and the herder people's livelihood, as well as border stability, uh, stability with Mongolia. Uh, the, the, the picture, the second one is uh, young people moved from the border to the city. So the, so the safety is uh, not like, is a little, uh, not a little dangerous than before. The third picture is show the groundwater level is lower than before. And this is the first, okay. Okay, next one. Oh, thank you very much. Our topic is, uh, yeah, it's ending. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Narangu. Uh, do we have Ms. Shi next? Ms. Shi Jiangjing? Yeah. yeah, she's ready, I think, yeah. Please go ahead. Hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be invited to this workshop and uh, share our experience. Uh, thanks, uh, Awan and um, uh, Narongo, to share their experience on the culture part and uh, uh, also the economic part and the property rights of the pastoral communities. And uh, now I'm going to share about the wildlife conservation and uh, the community management uh, in, the, in China. Um, so I'm from Shanshui Conservation Center. Uh, we were established in 2007 and we focus on the ecosystem and uh, wildlife conservation in China, both in forest ecosystem and uh, grassland ecosystem. So our methodology is based on the community conserved areas by collective governance, biodiversity monitoring and uh, conservation, sustainable livelihoods and uh, management of the conflicts and uh, climate resilience. Um, so I'm going to talk about our work uh, in the Tibetan Plateau um, next page, please. Mm. Um, so like our one, we are also working on the three river sources on the Tibetan plateau, the Sanjiang Yuan National Park, uh, but we have work in on the source of Mekong River. Uh, you can see our two sites, one uh, in orange color, one is in the Mekong River source, and one is in Jiatang Community Conserved Area. Um, so uh, it's similar to the Yellow River source, but um, with different challenges and uh, threats. Maybe some, some threats are in common. Um, so th this, place, uh, this place is very important habitat to many animals, especially big carnivals like snow leopard. Uh, which is a flagship species. And also uh, this place is critical area for water, ecological and cultural service, but it's very vulnerable to the climate change. Next page, please. Um, so because of the grassland uh, degradation in some places, we are engaging communities to do grassland restoration in the Jiatang communities. So our uh, methodology is that the collective governance and the decisions on the uh, natu natural resource management can be um, 
most sustainable and uh, effective in conservation um, and uh, development. So we're helping them to establish a community committee. Um, they have 10 persons to making rules and plans about natural resource uh, management. And they build up the mon monitoring system for grassland vegetation, ungulates wildlife by camera traps or samples. Um, and uh, they decide the, um, their plan on grassland restoration um, because there are some problems of the pikas, which is um, in addition to overgrazing uh, will cause the problem of degradation of the grasslands. So we plant, um, grass, uh, plant grass in the degraded, uh, degraded uh, place and the community will manage and uh, conserve the place. So it won't be, um, it can be so finally, we use, uh, we use, we use some training uh, workshops like herder school, so they can change the knowledge of the traditional knowledge uh, on the grassland restoration. So you can see from the picture, there are some wildlife pictures and uh, uh, there are workshops. And also we, uh, we join the ecosystem restoration um, uh, uh, initiatives. Next page, please. Another case is in, in the source of Mekong River. It's called the Valley of the Cats, about an ecotourism project. Uh, this is the landscape of the Nansai Township, which mixed landscape. And uh, it's very good habitat to wildlife like snow leopard. Next page, please. Um, and you can see from this map that uh, Tibetan Plateau is a habitat to eight large carnival species, very important uh, habitat. So, but uh, not only it's known the leopard, but also uh, blue sheep and uh, pikas and Tibetan fox, all other animals from an uh, uh, intact ecosystem. That's the goal of our conservation. Next page, please. But there are uh, some threats. Uh, one potential threat is the degradation of grassland, I have mentioned. And the second is the human disturbance because the development of this place and, its, and the trend of tourism that may harm the place. And the thirdly is the illegal hunting. Uh, also hunting uh, is forbidden in China. There are still some traps or um, potential risks of the illegal hunting, um, not only for the trade, but also because of the human wildlife conflict um, in the uh, villages, because the, the loss of yak from wildlife cost about 18% of their income. So uh, the, the community developed uh, the a solution with us together with the ecotourism. So the, the community managed ecotourism can share the benefit to everyone and uh, uh, the, the people can alternate, um, they, they can alter their livelihood from overgrazing to ecotourism. And also uh, by good governance, we can prevent from the private tourism uh, that will uh, prevent a lot of human disturbance. And also the national park give concession to this ecotourism so they can help the uh, village to develop the ecotourism and also prohibit private tourism from outside the companies. Uh, we think this is also benefit for the local communities to uh, sustainable development in this place. Uh, next play, page, please. Um, so you can, um, you can see the governance structure of this ecotourism concession is that the National Park Administration will authorize concession to the cooperate, co uh, cooperatives of the village and uh, the income from ecotourism will be shared 
um, so uh, 40, 45 percent will be will go directly to the host the families and uh, 40 percent will go to the village and um, so they will be community uh, manage the fund and 10% uh, of the income will go to the conservation fund for uh, wildlife like snow leopard. So uh, the benefit is not only go to the individual interest, but also shared by the whole communities. So everyone, every member of the communities will help this ecotourism by mm, cons uh, protect the wildlife. And the NGO like Shenshui and other NGOs will help the um, co-op co-ops and uh, we, we we are trying to uh, promote this project to more visitors outside okay next page and uh, this is uh the website the valley of the cats.org that you can book a trip to this place and uh, the whole experience will be direct by the local uh, family community families uh, they will host the uh, tourist uh, from the beginning to the end, but the, all of the tourists has to obey some rules of the national park. And uh, the money will be uh, managed by a managed team of the community. So there is a governance structure. Next page, please. Uh, these are some of the pictures from the visitors. Uh, you can see this snow leopard. Um, uh, actually, if you stay for uh, longer than three days, you uh, you have very, very big chance to see snow leopard. And uh, also there are other wild, wildlife, like this very cute pikas. <laughs> they are very common in this place. Next, please. And these are some photos from the visitors and the guides. Um, we can feel that the villagers are very proud to uh, have the visitors and to share their culture experience with the visitors because they stay with them in their traditional uh, tents and uh, um, they will experience their nomadic life. Next, please. And by the end of 2020, um, we have 21 families to be the host, host families. Uh, they have already hosted 133 teams from uh, more than 20 countries. Even though because of the COVID, now we can only receive visitors from the domestic market, but mm, they, they are still continue their um, business. And uh, all of the revenues will go to the families and also the communities. The community fund will um, share the benefit to everyone by buying medical insurance. So there is a basic um, security for everyone. And uh, um, this project was awarded 2020 person prize for sustainability. Next, please. Um, but uh, however, we have some lessons learned because there is always a conflict between benefit sharing and also the individual interest. Uh, we were criticized uh, uh, that this ecotourism is not so uh, free market um, because we, we keep the price not very high and we share all the benefit. Uh, but I think there is a way that the communities to do decisions and um, make their own rules. So um, I, this model will be developing uh, over time. And the second, uh, it's very hard to monitor the, their conservation behaviors. So we are doing camera traps uh, on the snow leopard and we hope there are some positive conservation uh, outputs outputs. And uh, thirdly, mm, there, there is some challenges and the risks about tourism because they rely on the outside market. 
for example, the uh, COVID-19 will uh, affect the local communities. Um, but we think um, because they still live on the nomadic um, husbandry, so they are keeping yaks. So even though uh, even the ecotourism income uh, is very low, they can still sustain their lives. So we think they are safe. Um, and uh, of course, there are great cultural shock to their traditional nomadic life because of the foreigners and uh, uh, like different kinds of people. But I think uh, some of them are happy with like um, uh, connect to the outside world. Um, okay, and uh, please next page. Uh, and uh, I, I, I would like to take this opportunity to say that uh, because of the COP15 is coming uh, and we are um, having this call for best case studies on biodiversity conservations um, by, uh, to, the, to, to all the NGOs and uh, companies and uh, institutions in the world. Um, and we will show these cases on the um, NGO uh, pa parallel forum of COP15. So um, if you are interested, uh, I will send this link to everyone uh, in our chat, uh, chat box. Um, and you can, uh, I hope to see your stories. <laughs> um, okay, uh, that's it. Um, next page is the last page, I think. Yeah, and thank you and welcome to China. Uh, I, would, I would like to sum up uh, for three of us uh, that uh, I think China is in very rapid ch change and uh, uh, we are very happy to um, share our experience and uh, listen to everyone's um, stories um, and uh, welcome to China, thank you. Thank you so much, Narangu and uh, Avang, for these lovely presentations and for inviting us to China. Um, we will move on. Uh, we have uh, some questions that have come to you in the chat box. So if uh, the three of you can directly address them, uh, that will be great. Um, before we move on to uh, Mongolia, we have a video message uh, from, uh, from Mongolia. Um, and we'll play that before we move on. Ah, 
Al şimdi ol ingil tel botuğan cihetim maldım. Asat ben beri gelip kurdum. Cengi bir sütte bir yerden koyup. Kayma, her türlü ürün deralatım bir ürkün tertip benim beri. İnce deyim zeyni bir de bu konuda. E tas. Soğan tarım tıpsa olmaz gerek. Hazır benim de beş yaşımdan beri ben tok. Ben her şeyin karakanda tabiatta tıraklı yok. Sol sebepten bolar. Tıraksız burun bulğanda bir ay, bir altı tabiat kalpın sağlık yapıyorum. Hazır iki gün de üç gün de tıklıyız, soğuk bu. Tıklıyız, çılı bol. Ağır ay tıraksız da. Sapası ne kesek? Bizde müna Жауым мол болса, қар мол болса, не қолдым дегенге жер тамырланады да шөптүн түрі де молай. Ал жауын тарт, қар тартып болған жағдайда, ал енді ары қарай малдың сапасына жеңе келетін болсақ, дұрыс пайдалану керек, төрт мезгілде Rus payıdılanıp, kıstağına, ceylağına, kuzeyine, mal oldu sakın Sol ülke kök dese, sol ülke ge jaylıtı görüp, kök demese baska jirge otar arkalı. Dere özünün gönlüsü dönüsü benim. Birikken tertipten, jengi de kavundasıdık. Bağlıq birikip çeşim. Çeşşi, so yerden tabiatın bilet, şöbünün çüygün durum bilet, soğunun tunuk durum bilet, kaygızda kalay paylansa degen, sol kukuktu kalıqa, toluğunan berse degen. Zan zünde kelgende, yerden kukun birikken tertip benim bilesin degen, ol jarar biyatır. Faktoluk kalıqa, çalpın yüzyılın büyüş şişi kuyduyum. Ekim çıktım burası, bu da hükümetten zan çıkıp, Hükümet var, Ayma Rakımın, Ayma Rakımın sunulun kürsetilip sizge kolda verilip durur. En basit mesele bizim olsa tuğ üstken tunuk avamız taza bolu gürük, din sağlıkta mesele. En birinci taza avan sağlıkta olmaz biz lastikten. Ava taza olsa adamın din sağlığı zor bulat. Üçüncü mesele, ırfaqtar olsa ülkege sağlıkta yaratında yiyip. Bilim cina gurup, son tevirat çalınca aksak gurup, o son tevirat'ın yerin sahtaydı, sojağından kat bilim cina gurup o yüzden, o da kajetti bilim de okuyor demişim sonra. Thank you, Sue. Um, from that beautiful video message, let's move on to our presenters from Mongolia. Uh, they are a group of uh, people representing the ICCA um, working group, which has been recently formed in Mongolia. And uh, Ms. Uh, Chansal Kham from the group will be presenting uh, today. So I'd like to ask them to go ahead. Uh, 
Unmute. Oh, Unmute. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so my name is Chanta. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. You can. You can. Uh, my name is Chansa, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here in this great workshop and also uh, to uh, uh, present on behalf of our ICCA Mongolia Working Group. So Mongolian herders, uh, custodians of rangelands and biodiversity, in this talk I would like to share some challenges we are facing with and then also some best pra practices. <clears throat> So Mongolia uh, has a land, huge land, and uh, one of the countries with intact rangelands on earth, one of the few, and about 72% of our total territory is uh, considered rangeland. And then this uh, open vast rangeland supports pastoralists uh, about 33% of Mongolia's population and 170,000 families. And, uh, and livestock number has been increasing and since 1990. And you can see on the screen, like we had 22 million livestock in 1990s and then doubled in 27 to 2007, and then almost doubled in 2020. And this sector actually support, contributes about 1.15% of the total uh, GDP. Um, Mongolia open West Rangeland classified into five uh, main ecological zones and high mountain and forest steppe in the north and the steppe and desert steppe in the middle and then three desert in the southern part of Mongolia. And the pastoral practices vary across these uh, uh, ecological zones from true nomadic herding in the desert uh, southern part to transhuman systems in the more fertile uh, forest in the northern part. According to the uh, Rangeland Health Monitoring conducted in 2018, about 10% of these uh, rangelands are reversibly degraded. In the right side of the map, you can see these red dots indicate these rangelands are already degraded reversibly. But the good news is that 42% uh, is healthy and then 13% is slightly degraded, which means one to three years of the uh, resting required to recover back, and 21% is moderately degraded, and 12% is severely degraded. Mongolian rangelands are resilient, but however, um, because of the combined uh, uh, impacts and effects uh, recently we are facing, actually approaching to this uh, degradation or reversibly deg degradation status. Major strategy to use this open and uh, sparse rangeland is uh, the movement or mobility. And then over centuries, this um, management uh, regime has been changing and uh, especially the movement pattern and the movement distance has been changing. Uh, during the Mongol empire and up to 16th century, uh, herders moved from north to south, more longitudinal movement, latitudinal movement uh, use it. And then during the Manchu uh, uh, 16th century, Manchu people divided the, the, uh, the uh, mobility and they divided the territory into 100 districts. So this actually again contributed uh, movement pattern. And then during the Soviet period, again, this territory divided into 100 and some sort of districts. So these different pasture rules actually uh, impacted the herders' movement. And uh, we, all, maybe most of you know, but Mongolia transitioned from Soviet system to the market economy in 1990s. And then this shift has actually impacted a lot of um, changes. And then especially since then livestock number increased, as I mentioned in my previous slides. And then there are a lot of movement in and out from the sector especially the city people who come to the countryside, become a further unskilled, and then after the natural disaster, they back to the city. So there are a lot of movement. And then also governance uh, become a very weak and then customer institution, it's sometimes also weakening. And then market loss actually contributed a lot and then also contributed to increase the livestock number. And then traditional grazing, uh, grazing management, like setting aside some 
preserved rangelands to be used during the harsh time is not anymore used. And then this contributed actually the, the herders um, moving from the customer use to more open access and then rich expanding grazing rights, poor herders are losing access, and which means there is a disparity. And then there is poor incentive for herders to manage the livestock quality. And then this contributed quality versus the quantity uh, shifts and then also changing the herd structure. For instance, due to the global demand for Kashmir, herders started increasing Kashmir goods. And then this also have contributed to decrease the season movements and decline of productivity and the market value. So <clears throat> increasing livestock number, uh, decreasing governance, and then all this contributed or uh, impacted to degrade the rangeland, increasing the vulnerability of herders, declining this uh, movement pattern. Another in threats to the rangeland and the pastoralism is uh, extractive industry is increasingly in, uh, in the last two decades and then these impacts on water and pasture resources and also contributed to permanent grazing areas uh, as of 2020 there are 4.7 percent of our total territory covered by active mining license and then there are two different mining license exploration and an active mining license. So you can see how many licenses already distributed to, uh, to the, the mining companies. Another challenge or threat we are facing is the climate is changing in Mongolia. The soil surface temperature has increased by 2.1%, which is already higher than the global average. And then shifting precipitation patterns and the snow is melting only. And then summer rain um, uh, intensity and then spatial distribution has changed. Glaciers are melting, which contribute to the uh, drying of many rivers, uh, you know, changes in many rivers and then streams, and then also increasing the number of dry days in, with the storms. All this climate change contribute uh, impact in the increasing the grassland aridity and the lower biomass. Uh, increasing the incidence of pasture insects and rodents, and then shifting ecological zones from uh, desertification. This change is impacting the reduced livestock productivity and the reduced grazing time. The herders actually started suffering. They have to move more further, more different, you know, more uh, unorganized manner, and, and also moving to increasing the grazing pressure on certain parcel of land where they have a, a range lands. And this also contributed to impact in their well-being and health of herders. We globally, we are also impacted uh, by the pandemic and then our pastoralists also affected and um, children cannot access the online uh, internet. So that's why they are way behind from the schooling and also herders are losing access to rangeland, uh, increasing the prices of uh, goods and food products and restricted some access to services. And then also because of the global pandemic, Kashmir, um, global Kashmir uh, demand and Kashmir prices decreased, which contributed herders income. Uh, another challenge is the social challenge. Uh, young people are leaving this sector and then also the families are separated during this uh, school time. Usually uh, men had to, has to have to take care of the livestock and stay with the livestock. Women uh, need to go to the some uh, district center to take care of the families, uh, take care of their kids to attend the schools. And then also parents prefer to send girls to the higher education. So there are also some, well, we can see some trends that are gender aspects already happening in rural areas. Just to give you an um, overview about the customary pastoral institutions. So there are three units, as you can see in this uh, slide. Ecological unit, since it's a common property, uh, rangelands I use the commonly ecological unit, usually we call it district level, more uh, larger in terms of territory. 
And then also we have a social unit, which is a Sakhalto neighborhood workers. And it's a, in terms of the land scale, it's a little uh, smaller than the ecological unit, but they usually help to each other to they, uh, uh, share labor and then share some resources and then help each other. And then a smallest unit, we call it economic unit. It's more hot at what we call it. Uh, the herders usually camp together, two or three families. And Sakhaltad maybe five or 10 families. And so economic unit of the hotel is also share labor and then share uh, uh, economic uh, activities. Can you hear me? What's going on? Okay, oh, sorry. So <clears throat> we, in Mongolia, there are um, community-based natural resource management groups so by pastoralists have been uh, established in over the last 20 years. Uh, the main purpose is to reduce the vulnerability, increase adaptive capacity to natural uh, harsh uh, conditions such as salt and drought. And then uh, studies are showing that there are some higher social outcomes. Community herders who joined in these community groups have more um, innovative in managing their rangelands and better in livestock management practices. And then they have a greater social networks and then having more trust between with them and mutual assistance and also greater access to information and then more becoming more proactive in solving issues and communicating with local authority, authorities. Um, there are two main uh, forms of these community organizations. First, uh, it's a pasture user groups. These groups are more about the Sahel uh, level, a territory based rangeland management group. But they, uh, there are about 1,500 user groups in Mongolia established over the last 15 years, and then 80 million hectares under the uh, management. And then 920 PUGs under this, uh, of these pasture user groups created already strong rangeland use agreement with the local government. Uh, main activities of these first forms is facilitating mobility and seasonal pasture use. And then also they created this community revolving fund to manage the rangeland, to improve the rangeland condition, and also provide some small loans to members. And then also start to calculate the carrying capacity. And then also with the government support, uh, with the project support, other initiative support, they started conducting photo monitoring for the rangeland they are using. And the second form is a volunteer Nuhurlul. These are uh, still territory based, but a smaller scale, a smaller size, and then members are more voluntary based. And then the focusing more on the conservation and the managing of the natural resources, including rangeland, forest, and wildlife, and uh, flora and fauna. And then at, as of today, there are 1,600 Nuhurlul are established and they're managing over eight plus million hectares of land. Uh, and also I should say here there are also Nuhurlus not registered yet, but they are still managing the land and this is not included in this uh, statistics. Uh, the organization form of these uh, groups are based on the environmental law, management responsibility for natural resources, and then it's delegated to this community and then including this forest uh, user groups. <clears throat> uh, main activities are um, also focusing more on species conservation, landscape level protection, and water resources, water sources protection, and co-management of state protected areas. Oh. Okay, in this slide, you can see two maps. The first left-hand side map is state protected areas. Uh, about 29 million is under state protected areas. And then you can see the red ones, straight, red colors in this map indicate strictly protected areas. Blues are national parks and yellows are natural reserves and uh, purples are natural monuments. Uh, but in addition to that, there are uh, initiatives or the uh, activities happening is local, establishing the local protected areas. So these actually increasing the significantly in recent years. 
and becoming more important instrument in securing the grazing lands and other customer resources from them and protecting from the mining licenses. And you can see in the right hand map this uh, brown um, brown borders indicate this uh, uh, the local protected areas. And then under the local protected area, there are 27 million hectares is already um, designated, which is also good start and then good initiative. We have, uh, I would like to also share some examples of our uh, so these community groups in the in Hurlington National Park, uh, uh, focusing on this uh, wild sheep, mountain wild sheep, Argali, and then they manage and protecting from outside poaching. And also they benefit from uh, the management and uh, protection. And another group is uh, in 2016 community managed areas in Gobi Burun Sehan National Park. And then they covering approximately 25% of the entire park area. And then these further uh, communities actually uh, in implementing this uh, the gear to gear and other the local uh, tourism. And the third example is the Hustay National Park and the, managed by the national uh, NGO uh, with the local community herders. And then the herders agreed to, uh, to manage the buffer zones and then also they agreed to avoid grazing in areas critical for this uh, wild um, introduced uh, horse, in, in this, which is also endemic endangered species. Um, if you look at the example of the local protected areas, uh, most important thing is the local protected areas maintain ecological corridors, enabling wildlife movement between protected areas and uh, also the piloting these new governance types in these areas. So in Hinti Anag and Dharna Anag and uh, also Anag, we already eastern, far east and the far east, west, we have a wild animals and then these local protected areas actually uh, playing quite critical role and then the herder pastoral communities are uh, becoming more active and working together. Um, <clears throat> another uh, example to, um, to adapt or to uh, reduce these challenges I mentioned earlier is Conservation Trust Funds, uh, which is uh, established by pasture user groups. So these three uh, groups established this finance nature conservation and registration activities. So they provide loans to member households and then support volunteer ranger uh, actions. Uh, another uh, initiative or conservation action is certification of products from sustainable and responsible rangeland use. So this is actually becoming more um, nuanced and then becoming more uh, expanding in Mongolia. Uh, herder communities are trying to get the certificate and then to access the better uh, market, better European market that really care about the rangeland and uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, another uh, initiative is Responsible Nomad. It's another, there are actually three different uh, certification schemes have been started and then piloting in Mongolia. The first one is uh, Kashmir. Um, certification and the second one is I was mentioned responsible nomad. Uh, this is uh, herders who really uh, did well can get the premium price and then become a more uh, uh, strong uh, member of this uh, value chain. So if we to uh, wrap up in a minute, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So significance of this community-based conservation is first very thing is uh, uh, securing the pastoral resources and pastoral rangeland, and then so does the cultural values. Uh, and then also community-based conservation contributes to uh, national goals, uh, which is 30% of all land will be under this form of protection. And then uh, this local level protection contributes to connectivity conservation corridors, which is very uh, critical uh, to protect the biodiversity. And then also specific conservations, including iconic species like wild mountain uh, 
sheep and then snow leopards and uh, other migrating, large migration, migrating mammals in the eastern steppe of Mongolia. Uh, another important thing, educating young generation of pastoralists on traditional practices and then science versus conservation approaches are really the, the tool uh, for the community business conservation. And uh, <clears throat> I will move on. So we know that I mentioned the religion degradation is a one challenge and because of the mobility, because of the last number and the combined effect of climate. So all these best practices in the last two decades can really uh, help us to lessen and reduce. And then we also need uh, not only the uh, countrywide in a global scale, uh, region scale uh, voices and then supports are really critical. And so to be able to do that, we really need to have the monitoring activities that can really present the current status and then future prediction and then that can also inform back the pastoralists to manage the rangeland condition properly. And since we have a less time, there are three, four different uh, rangeland monitoring activities uh, uh, happening around the country and then by different uh, government organizations and then non-government organizations and then border institutions. So pasture user group are actually playing quite critical role. And then there are some studies showing that the herd indicators herders are using to monitor the rangeland actually really uh, uh, similar like what government levels monitoring. So that's why there are also uh, initiatives to, uh, how do we call it, align and then combine these uh, different uh, monitoring approaches and then to be able to have a common and uh, nationwide uh, management. Uh, also there are key policy message, message as I was mentioning, mobility is very integral and very important strategy, especially to use this low productivity environment. And uh, environmentally sustainable approach is just only uh, mobility. And then we cannot, in a sense, or we cannot settle down to be able to use efficiently in this uh, sparsely, um, sparse, uh, vegeta sparse uh, re resources. Uh, if we reduce the mobility, it decreases the vulnerability of pastoral livelihoods and then become more vulnerable to natural disaster disasters. Uh, and then also, if we reduce the mobility, it contributes to environmental degradation. Therefore, it's very critical to keep this strategy and then continue the strategy and then increase the strategy, especially it needs to be uh, reflected in the land laws, government service institutions and economic structures. With that, thank you very much and happy to answer your question and comments. Thank you so much, Ms. Chansal. Um, we will move on now. Uh, uh, do we have uh, Sajal? Sajal, can you um, present or should we move on? Yes, I am here. Okay. So yeah. our presentation. So can you uh, can you present? Yes. Internet is low at my. Go ahead, go ahead, Sajal. We'll we'll start presenting. Okay, I am Sajal Kulparni. I'm working as a state coordinator for revitalizing rainfed agricultural network Maharashtra, and basically with Kaustu. Uh, Pandri Pandey, who is leading Foundation for Economic and Ecology, uh, Ecological Development. We are trying to uh, develop a grassland policy for the state uh, with the help of Animal Husbandry Department as well as Forest Department. Next. So basically, in Maharashtra, we have arid and semi-arid uh, savanna zones. Next. Uh, preliminary study shows that about 70% percent is savanna grassland in uh, India. So uh, at government records or even at policy level, it is considered as wasteland. <clears throat> Next. Uh, so uh, regarding pastoralism, pastoralism is 
old story uh, in the uh, in our country and around 13000 years we can trace out our for the pastoral communities and their practices uh, 7% to 9% the population is pastoral uh, community in uh, in the country uh, basically 88 million people uh, are practicing extensive <clears throat> uh, livestock system or uh, what we can say open system in the country uh, all these communities have their migratory routes uh, they are moving from one uh, place to another as mentioned in this map um, so basically they are uh, interacting with wildlife landscape local communities agriculture lands even uh, landscape like the wind farms also next so this is a special uh, specific uh, story from washim district of maharashtra where kostuk is working um, he has uh, develop a community based grassland conservation model in one village of uh, semi nomadic or what we can say nomadic community uh, called as uh, phase pardi and uh, conservation of lesser known florican with them and the village is now uh, conserving around 200 hectares of grassland and strengthening the uh, uh, Used for their securing their livelihood as well as uh, conserving lesser florican with order security for uh, livestock keepers with local grass species. Next, so by these examples and uh, experiences, uh, we have developed a task force for. grassland uh, policy level changes in maharashtra state of india <clears throat> around 2 and 1/2 lakh hectares of the forest land in maharashtra is declared already as a uh, reserve fodder plots but <clears throat> there was no management plan or interaction with animal husbandry department was not there uh, this community uh, base uh, development of this grassland so we have proposed and now this task force is working pilotly uh, pilot we have taken for 5000 hectares in the state uh, through forest right act and biodiversity management committees <coughs> uh, then consideration of uh, local traditional varieties of fodder or grasses we are recommending for uh wildlife as well as uh, local livestock keepers also uh major emphasis will be on biodiversity conservation local grass species and local communities this is the uh, uh gr I mean, government resolution we have uh, successfully passed in december 2020 and now we have planning to have this pilot program on 5000 hectares of land in this state next next okay so uh, this experience uh, is basically for uh, how to deal with uh, means or government officials as well as uh, uh, two within two departments and strengthening the local communities to how to manage the resources uh for by ajay we have lost you we cannot hear you uh, audible yes now you are yeah. now you are go ahead so uh can i repeat what i have said last yes please okay so uh, basically uh, all these uh, experiences and uh, interaction with government uh, regime we have successfully tried to develop a state level plan 
for biodiversity conservation of grassland as well as securing the livelihood of local pastoral as well as non pastoral livestock keepers hello hello yes, sir. yeah so so uh, means this experience we uh, that is why we shared this experience to all first you strengthen the uh, local community then use the uh, hello yes sir jal go ahead please carry on we are able to okay. hear okay so uh, step by step if we consider strengthening the local community for conservation of local uh, grassland resources is the first step through that that experience uh, interacting with government officials and provisions what they have made uh, in their schematic uh, arrangements uh, that we need to appropriate and uh, like what i have shared in the experience of maharashtra this can be done through legal as well as uh, community based processes thank you i am done minal thank you sajal thank you so much yeah uh, sorry i have, i don't have uh, uh, internet uh, right now that's that's okay that's okay thank you so much thank you, for, uh, thank you for thank uh, you for staying on and giving us your presentation thank you thank you um we from india we now move on to iran and we have uh, nahid who is going to present their experiences uh, and uh, nahid you can take the floor thank you mina can you share the typeon presentation yes uh, i would like to tell a brief story on the way we started working with mobile pastoralists as semester under the leadership of dr farwa rest in peace and the way we continue now with the leadership of Dr. Khadija Razavi and accompaniment of the mobile pastoralist organizations at various tribal levels and the unions and federations at Uni Nomad and Uni Camel. Can you share my PowerPoint presentation you now? Yes, thank you. Next, please. Yeah, despite various challenges, I would like also to uh, visualize our collective commitment and practices on re-empowering mobile pastoralists uh, and policy influence toward recognition of the territories of life and territory-based range management at various levels. Next, please. Yes. Iran is a vast country, lies on the world's arid belt, and about 80% of its land comprises uh, arid and semi-arid regions, including rangelands, forests, and deserts. And nomadic pastoralists, um, with about 2% of the total population of Iran, are spread over 30 million hectares of the country's rangelands, which is nearly 35% of the total rangelands of the country. And Senesta works with nine major groups of tribal confederacies and two independent tribes in West, East, Northwest, South, and Central deserts of Iran. Next, please. This timeline highlights the policy and political changes of the last century with important impact on mobile pastoralist customary governance systems of natural resources and impact on the rights of the pastoralists over their territories of life and specify how the governance system and institutions of pastoralists weakened to induce the forced sedentarization programs in different uh, periods of time and nationalization of forests and rangelands since 1960. 
In result of these policies and programs, mobile pastoralists encountered various challenges, such as degradation and destruction of their rangelands by expansion of agricultural lands, execution of various development projects, executive in, uh, extractive industries, and peak towns and urbanization. Therefore, Senesta started a participatory process based on participatory situation analysis with nomadic pastoralists at a different, you know, previous one, please. Previous slide. Yeah. Uh, and we started participatory situation analysis with mobile pastoralists and they draw the desirable future visioning and they develop their own strategy and action plan to address these challenges and the Senesta facilitated. Next, please. This process through re-empowering mobile pastoralists and their traditional governance institutions to stand up as legally recognized actors and also uh, we facilitated registering the uh, tribal organizations and community-based organizations at sub-tribe, tribe and uh, tribal confederacy levels for reclaiming the appropriate recognition and governance of territories of life. Also, we facilitated the establishment of Uni Nomad, the Union of Indigenous Nomadic Tribes of Iran, and Uni Camel, the Union of Indigenous Camel Herders of Iran, uh, uh, their national federations. These registered institutions make more substantial ground to influence policies and reclaiming their rights over their territories of life to effective dialogue and collaboration with other stakeholders. Next, please. For example, revision of the natural resource comprehensive law in a participatory process and in result uh, pastoralist policy recommendations or participatory governance assessment of protected areas and conserved areas with multi stakeholder with government agencies, pastoralists, and civil society organizations. Also, uh, no, previous one. Also, advocacy and lobby with policy and decision makers in recognition of the concept of territory and avoid fragmentation of territories of life and advocacy for the rights of mobile pastoralists over their territories within the framework of national and international policies and laws. Next one, please. We developed participatory GIS map by uh, Senesta facilitators, and especially with our dear sister and colleague, Ganimet Ajdari, rest in peace, to identify the threats and occupations with pastoralist territories, within pastoralist territories of life. And the we developed the restitution plan to reclaiming the rights. Uh, and we used the participatory GIS maps as an effective instruments for dialogue and collaboration with relevant state agencies and other stakeholders. Next, please. And in result, the involvement and participation of mobile pastoralist organization and registered uh, institutions and uni nomad, uh, they involved actively in design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation process of a series of projects, you know, the previous one, series of projects, at least 20 projects, particularly with the UNDP, Jeff SGP of the UNDP and Global Support Initiative Phase One and other stakeholders to cope with climate change issues, understanding and promoting the ICCAs and the territories of life, also organizational cohesion of their institutions and policy influence and promoting innovative livelihoods uh, within their territories and restoration of rangelands and other actions, as you will see in the following slides. Next one, please. Yeah, this is the first participatory project about territories of life in Qashqai Tribal Confederacies for recognition of the first ICCA through the issue of an official. Yeah, this is the uh, another. Yeah, next one, please. I'll go, I will review all these projects. Yeah, this is another project uh, on understanding and promoting territories of life in Iran and beyond. Next. And this is uh, next. 
And this is another action by uh, Abul Hassani Tribal Confederacy Institution for reviving indigenous uh, community conserved areas and to cope with climate change issues. Next. And another project in Chodari Independent Tribe in Central Desert. And another one, yeah, next, please. I just go, yeah. And restoration traditional inverted tulip uh, ICCAs in uh, Farrokhwan tribe of Bakhtiari tribal confederacies. And another action, next one, yeah, on empowering Iran's indigenous nomadic tribes towards poverty eradication and nature conservation. And another one, yes, next. In Shah Saban tribal confederacy territories in northwest of Iran and their ICCAs. And next one, yeah. And again, in south of Iran within Kashgai tribal confederacy and ecotourism, community based ecotourism practices. Next, please. Next, yeah. And strengthening the productive capacity of the tribal territory in Qut uh, sub tribe. And this is another, uh, yeah. This is another action, the capacity building to promote organizational cohesion of uni, uni nomads that is currently under execution with the technical support of SEMESNA and with the support of UNDP, Jeff, SGP and uni nomad. Next one, please. This is again another project in Hamula sub-tribe of Bakhtiari Tribal Confederation in West of Iran. It's currently under execution for documentation of traditional knowledge on range management system as customary and their customary institution for rangeland management. Next one, please. And another one again for revival of customary management of natural resources in Farrokhwan Tribal uh, customary territory uh, and re regeneration of plant diversity. Next one, it is also uh, currently under execution and empowerment of Abul Hassani nomadic tribes against climate change resilience and issues through promoting innovative uh, livelihoods. This is also currently on this, under execution. Next one, please. Yeah, and this is another one of revival uh, uh, rangelands in Bakhtiari Tribal Confederacy in Rostami South Tribe. This is also currently under execution. Next one, please. Yeah, and finally, we give two messages and call for stronger support at policy and practice arena for recognition of territories of life and ICCAs and promote the role of pastoralists and their governance system to achieve territory-based sustainable range management and conservation of biocultural diversity. Also to promote their role in restoration of rangelands and ecosystems within their territories. Also we call for building alliances at, uh, of all right holders and stakeholders at national and international level to actively support and take action on the International Year of Pastoralists and Rangelands to go ahead. Thank you so much for your attention. And you can display the last, thank you. And we will have a five minutes of video by the narration of Dr. Farber. I would like to display that. Thank you so much for your attention. Indigenous peoples and local communities are at the forefront of governance for conservation because they develop their governance institutions through centuries of direct dependence on nature for their very survival. Thank you. 
institutions learn to respond to the vagaries of climate, learn to manage conflicts, learn to meet the changing needs of people with very little chance for error. accumulated knowledge and wisdom of these uh, communities and these indigenous peoples actually exhibits itself not only in the management of nature but also in the way they manage the relationships among people also produced the recommendation on food and water sovereignty. Basically, all who have the power to do so should take concrete steps to ensure the food and water sovereignty of producer communities in protected and conserved areas, including the right to use, save, and freely exchange diverse seeds and livestock breeds building upon cultural diversity, traditional knowledge, and practices and local innovations. Thank you so much, Nahid, and uh, also for that beautiful film. Um, we have, uh, we'll go ahead with our last presentation now from Kyrgyzstan. And we have uh, Ms. Anara uh, Alimkulova from the Institute for Sustainable Development Strategy Public Fund with us. Uh, Ms. Anara, uh, if you can go ahead, the floor is all yours. Thank you. So my name is Anara Lankulova and uh, I'm very pleased to be with all of you today and have a great chance to uh, share an experience of Kyrgyzstani pastoralist communities today. So uh, we are very new uh, uh, member of ICCA uh, consortium. So we became a member uh, uh, the consortium this year. So I'm, um, I uh, have already participated in some events, uh, gathering of the ICC consortium, but it's, for me, it's very interesting uh, to learn more about the experiences of uh, uh, pastoralists uh, uh, from uh, different countries. And today, so I will uh, share some experience. Actually, so um, I was very lucky um, I don't remember the year, but I was very lucky to to meet uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. 
tangy um, and also turns uh, during uh, uh, the, uh, uh, uh, their um, visits in Kyrgyzstan. I think, and I think it's two, three years ago in Kyrgyzstan. So that uh, actually uh, they visited the place um, and also communities, uh, the experience of which I, I will uh, present today. So next. Uh, so that the, um, uh, I called the presentation about, uh, uh, to share about the community-based uh, conservation or uh, community-based uh, management uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, especially in the northern part of Kyrgyzstan. So here you, you can see the, um, the map of uh, the country. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, um, and more than 90% uh, uh, of the territory of Kyrgyzstan is occupied by mountain uh, ridges of Tenshan, uh, uh, Tenshan, I'm sorry. Uh, Tenshan and Pamiralai. So mount, mountain are valued for its, uh, in uh, here are valued for its natural pasture. This total area more than uh, 9 million hectares. And out of all agricultural lands, 85% are natural pastures. Uh, over 40% of the whole territory of the whole territory of the Kyrgyzstan is occupied by pasture. And the average altitude of pasture is uh, over 2000 uh, meters above the sea level. And one of three of the dam is located on the altitude from 400 to 3000 uh, meters above the sea level. Next slide, please. So uh, I, I will share the experience about uh, traditional pasture management. So our pastoral uh, communities have accumulated a thousand year experience. Uh, uh, experience uh, livestock farming uh, without harming the environment due to the different altitudes as well as the exposure of individual pasture areas, uh, the vegetation of them occurs in different uh, periods from one month to um, 10 months, which historically determined the seasonal nature of pasture use. That's why a local communities develop original traditional land use systems. They have been uh, substantially eroded over 70 years of Soviet Union through settlement. So the forced settlement, collectivization, and this industrialization of livestock production, followed by a chaotic transition to independence and the free market. As a result, many pasture users stop moving their cattle to distant pastures, diffusing in fact traditional methods of moving cattle to pastures. Because of the useless attitude and unsystematic use, the process of secondary degradation of pastures has gone everywhere. Next slide, please. So that here, so that um, about seasonal pasture rotation, moving from one pasture to another uh, pasture, uh, according to four seasons, it was like Jasdo, um, Koktom, uh, which, uh, which means in a uh, Kyrgyz spring pasture, Jailo, summer pasture, and Kuzdo, autumn pasture, and Kishto, winter pasture. And every seasonal uh, pasture was used only for one uh, season. This is allowed to soil and plants to fully recover during, uh, during all other seasons. Next slide. And uh, main reasons uh, of uh, degradation of uh, pastures, uh, ranch lands, uh, so it's uh, uh, uh, like excessive pressure on, pasture, on the pastures, unsystematic um, uh, grazing uh, leads to deteri deterioration of grasslands, increase uh, in number of livestock, uh, irra irra irrational uh, uh, pasture man uh, management, um, destruction of soil and its fertility, and local, uh, as a result, local herders almost forgot traditional knowledge and traditional pasture management. And uh, depletion of biodiversity uh, and uh, losing uh, our unique mount uh, mountain landscape. Please, uh, the next slide. Uh, so that uh, I would like to share the experience of, of um, 
our uh, working with uh, Chopon Rural Municipality, uh, which is uh, located in the northern part of Kyrgyzstan. So the uh, the um, the um, so the Chopon Rural Municipality actually consists of eight uh, villages and is located in inner Tenshan Mountains. So in uh, Kochkor district of Narin province and um, placed on uh, uh, over, um, it's, it's about 2,000 to 4,000 uh, meters above sea level. The total area of the territory is more than 52,000 uh, 52, hectares uh, of which about uh, 50, uh, thousand hectares are pastures. The total population is uh, over 8,000 people uh, and uh, uh, a mountainous area is a very fragile natural environment. So uh, pastures are mainly desert and semi-desert. And uh, as a result of excessive grazing for the, um, uh, for the last uh, 20 years, local uh, pastures are sever severely degraded, which leads to deterioration of the whole ecosystem. The, second, uh, the, the next slide, please. So that we work, um, we work uh, a little. I will uh, talk about the uh, like some uh, uh, period of working with this community. So that uh, our main uh, main objective uh, was to empower local community members and increase uh, uh, their resilience and adaptation to climate change through revival and preservation of traditional pastoralism practices. And so what we uh, have done, what, uh, what we, uh, uh, uh, our main approaches, so that the first was um, introduction of community-based pasture conservation based on traditional knowledge and practice. Uh, and also uh, documentation of traditional knowledge, especially uh, traditional practice related to uh, pasture land and uh, cattle breeding. So, and also uh, interaction of all stakeholders to enhance, uh, to enhance the adaptive potential of the local population, uh, including youth to climate change by creation and development of the community climate adaptation centers, uh, centers uh, in the community. There, there was like a number of trainings for herders. Uh, we also provided together with the local community, we provided local uh, festivals, uh, forum theaters, with participation of school and um, local uh, school students uh, and uh, street uh, theaters with involvement of local pasture users and villages. So the, um, the uh, community-based conservation, uh, which is a strategy to reinforce uh, conservation initiatives laid, uh, led by self-governing communities based on traditional ecological uh, knowledge. So that our joint initiative um, uh, provo uh, actually promotes uh, this concept by involving local people, pasture users, and decision-making around pasture and natural resources management. Next slide, please. So what uh, actually, I mean, uh, main achievement and uh, result what we have done. So uh, uh, there we, uh, together, uh, we created climate change adaptation uh, center uh, to revive traditional system and climate adapt adaptation strategies uh, by um, using participatory rural appraisal approach to map and document traditional knowledge and practices, redu uh, reducing the vulnerability of the local community to the effects of climate change, reveal the available tools of collective solutions for climate change and pasture management. We also do inventory, detailed inventory and documenting cattle and pastures to develop pasture management and conservation strategy and introduce into practice. Uh, we also uh, did a revival of traditional knowledge and customs of uh, nomadic migration to remote pastures and conservation of pastures. Uh, so that now local communities and local pastoralists consider the ba balance between scientific approach and traditional nature management and pasture ecosystem. So we involve uh, several um, uh, uh, several people from academia to help uh, to um, uh, to help local communities uh, to uh, have like uh, uh, scientific uh, in in the scientific uh, side. Uh, the uh, the herders in in result the herders are equipped with traditional methods of nomadic movement 
and now they don't remain at the same place all season to support uh, plants recovery. So collaborative strategies of pasture conservation uh, using traditional knowledge and practices have long-term effect to improve the well-being of pasture user, uh, users while preserving and improving the condition of land resources. Uh, community campaigns and public, um, public meetings uh, were conducted to systemize uh, traditional knowledge and popularize it among other uh, pastoral com uh, committees uh, in the region and actually in the country, um, uh, in the uh, country level. Climate monitoring system uh, was integrated and revised based on the best practices of traditional pastoralism. So the uh, local pastoralists started using the knowledge and practices inherited from the experiences of our ancestors to sustainably manage uh, their um, pasture lands. The, the second, or the next slide, please. And the, uh, the following results. So the herders moved from degraded pastures to the remote pastures uh, on the Sonku Lake. Uh, located on the altitude more than 3,000 meters above uh, sea level. Before it was used only on 20% resulted in spreading uneatable herbs. And uh, this conservation uh, has started from uh, uh, 30 hect hectares in 2016. Then uh, the uh, local communities um, uh, put 90, uh, 900 hectares under conservation. And fun finally, uh, now they conserve more than 9,000 hectares uh, based on traditional knowledge and practice. Practices. One of the main achievements of, uh, of our um, joint collaboration was the decision to ban the most degraded pasture for three years and the schedule of uh, gradual migra migration to alpine meadows in compliance with traditional custom and rituals. Uh, uh, actually, you know that um, last year, last year, uh, the uh, uh, um, the community was very successful and uh, and uh, was lucky to uh, to get uh, an, um, a support from uh, GF uh, GSI program uh, to um, uh, to like uh, to scale up. Uh, this approach in uh, other in other communities uh, uh, in other communities in uh, this uh, in, uh, in in this province and also now this uh, concept is scaled up up to uh, I think 15 uh, 15 um, communities around um, Krasta. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Anara. And uh, I would also thank all the other um, presenters for giving us such wonderful presentations and sharing your experiences with us. And um, we can already see that there is a lot of interaction in the chat room, uh, in the chat box. And uh, this is one of the main um, aims of this event that people start talking to each other um, on the various activities that uh, are going on. Um, if, if it is okay with the presenters and uh, the participants, maybe we can move the break ahead and um, take it right now. We have decided to have a 10 minutes uh, break um, and then we can come in and reconvene uh, after 10 minutes. Is, is that okay? Does it sound okay for everybody? Uh this is okay, uh, but fix the time of coming back. Like it's going to be 4.25. Yes, 4.25. So Good. should we reconvene at that time? To me, okay. <laughs> uh, Nahid, I can't hear you. Somebody to second me, Dr. Sharma. Uh, hi, Sadhana. Okay. <laughs> so, during break time. <laughs> Thank you, Hijaba. <laughs> Thank you very much for your joining us. Thank you. So, we have now to, to speak in our activities, yes? And after, just after the break. Just after the break, yes. We yeah. reconvene at uh, 4.25. 4.25, yeah. So, yes.
Sadan, uh, I will use maybe around a uh, minute, 10 minutes. And okay. then and you and uh, Dr. Kusai may will use another, another 12 minutes for your uh, six, seven minutes per each. Is that okay? Okay, for me, eight minutes I have planned. Oh, exactly, for you eight minutes and then I will just, we try to finish in nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will a little bit wrap in that case. Okay, so I also try to a little bit uh, uh, uh, as quick as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a break and reconvene um, in 10 minutes. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So.
so dr sudana mr khan bhai are you ready should i start okay thank you okay um so our next session is going to be very very interesting we have uh, three chairs from three regional support groups for the iyrp who will be giving us uh, a very brief um, overview of all the activities that the regional support groups have been carrying on towards um, gathering support for the iyrp so without further ado i would uh, hand over the session to uh, dr khan bhai uh, dr sadana and uh, dr badripur thank you Uh, hello everyone you will see me do you hear me yes no? doctor we can hear you yes okay okay uh, here, hi everyone i hope during the break you have a bit rest after the good music <laughs> so now i would like to talk about activities of regional support group central asia and mongolia for iyip internationally of rangelands and pastoralists so as this session on an iyip i would like to a little bit uh, talk about the process of of, uh, of going the a proposal on iyip of course uh, in august uh, 2019 the mongolian government proposed iyip to un then the international support group which is uh, uh, many people here, for example, Jurgen and others, become closer to Mongolian team. Before that time also in during the 2019, 2018, it already was discussed the process of IYIP in many international activities and events and proposed uh, to consider on that. So Mongolian government started in 2019, the proposal and uh, uh, it uh, and then October 2020, the FAO Committee on on on Agriculture (COAG) endorses Mongolian government proposal for IYIP for uh, in 2026. So international year will come 2026. It will approve it finally. Also, FAO Council in December 2020 and the FAO Conference in June. 2021 accepted the proposal uh, proposal so that's right now so uh, currently the proposal is an international initiative involving many countries and the organizations uh, currently the proposal supported by over 275 organizations and over 34 national government. So you can see it in, in your UIIP website, which is here. And so now our next uh, stage is final approval of IUIP uh, uh, proposal uh, by UNI United Nations General Assembly, Yunga, in September 2021, in this year. So we are very close to final our uh, stage. We hope it will done. Um, so just a few words about why uh, we need IYIP. Uh, one is, is there, there are two, four main, uh, which I bring here, four main uh, uh, uh, uh, reasons why, but these four is under the, four, the many, many other reasons, but these four is just, uh, just uh, highlighting the main reasons. One is to increase the worldwide understanding the importance of rangelands and pastorals. It's very similar, very uh, in, in, in coincidence with ICCA consortium now is doing and objecting about our ICCA consortium, as I think. It's very much important for food security, as you know. The, uh, we want that pastorals as, as food producers, 
in the environmental services, pastoralists as custodians of environmental protection. They are living in the, the territory, they're conserving the ecosystem. So that's why I think we all discuss here these issues. And then uh, to get support for all levels at decision making for policy support. And second, and then to mobilize people to worldwide to today's challenges to address our national government internationally. And then lastly, to uh, boost the effort for creating new knowledge and sharing experiences among the people, rangelands and pastoralists. Of course, here very important to sharing knowledge between the pastoralists, between the herders and herders, or between the local communities. That's very important one. So I would like to uh, little about introduce about uh, Central Asia Mongolia uh, Risk uh, Regional International Support Group or IYIP. Uh, IYIP is, <coughs> is uh, we have post meeting at the uh, end of 2020. And then in the post meeting, our members uh, uh, comes to conclusion that uh, IYIP issues already uh, is, is working in Central Asia, functioning during the IYIP proposal development. Our all members involved for the development of IYIP proposal in Mongolia and also regionally in Central Asia. And uh, it suggested, suggested that we use the clusters of Kappa. Kappa is Central Asian Pastoral Alliance as a base for uh, regional support group for Central Asia in Mongolia. So that's why uh, uh, Central Asia Mongolia support group uh, uh, now during the last time uh, discuss, accept regional action plan Regional, uh, uh, uh, regional communication uh, product like uh, player activities to lobby uh, IYP in each country in Central Asia. Currently among, among the Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan is actively supporting the IYP proposal and other countries, our members lobbying currently also many members from Central Asian countries supporting IYP proposal. Uh, so we are now our members working for the lobby for national governments to say yes at the Yunga United National Answer for the approval of IYIP proposal. That's our current task. So uh, as I said, uh, Kappa uh, Central Asian Pastoral Alliance, little bit. What? Why is a base for or, or regional activity? Because as you see here today, the nomadic pastoralism is a way of life in many communities in Central Asia. And that's why uh, our, uh, we have uh, uh, created Asia Rangeland Initiative on Diversity Systems supported by ILC, International Land Coalition, since 2020-2016. So it has two parts. One is Asia Rangeland Initiative, Central Asian Rangeland Initiative, and then South Asia Rangeland Initiative. So since 2019, Central Asian Initiative became a Central Asia Pastoral Alliance as Kappa. So we are engaging from 2019 very much for the IYIP proposal. Currently, uh, Kappa includes 49 organizations. Their members, partners, as a uh, including ILC members, central and local government bodies, CSOs, NGOs, pastoralist associations, private sectors, and many other organizations, members of our, our, our, our regional support group and the Kappa network. So it is an ne open network for all stakeholders and in the, of course, in the regional level for the support of IYIP. So uh, Kappa, we are working from root level, from local level. So we are working our communities in pasture user groups, forest user groups, local groups, to the national level activities, working with ministries like IYIP proposal closely uh, is proposed by the Mongolian Ministry of Port and Agriculture and Light Industry. So we are very much close working with the national governments. As of course at national level, we are, so regional support group for IYIP. So this uh, is interrelated our activities at, at all levels. So in, 
in Kappa, we have uh, five clusters. So one is uh, community lands. That's exactly the same as, as we are talking here. The communities are custodians of environmental protection and so on the use of rangelands. Currently in Central Asia, we have three models of community-based pasture management, like Mongolian model, model which is community-based natural resource management and pasture user groups, which is organized by themselves as local, local groups, as already our presentation is told. And secondly, is a model on pasture committees, local governments cooperating, pasture user unions, which is very much using now in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And also we have a model based on co-management with local lead by government agencies, which is mostly used in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, and other countries of Central Asia. So this is a very, uh, our, our effort is for, for IUIP activities to support these communities to conserving the local uh, rangelands, uh, local ecosystem in Saudi's uh, pasture lands. And we have also cluster on policy issues. So in Central Asia, all countries have legal base, special laws for pasture, pasture uh, on laws on pasture and pasture lands, as well as other laws, and they all uh, all is included uh, like uh, uh, the, the, the, the, the legal base and the policy base for co-management and national management in these countries. Also, <clears throat> we have. We are reviewing uh, uh, policy and legal regulations with, together with local governments, also stakeholders, pilot studies and field works. And uh, now we are mobilizing, influencing for sub laws and procedure, procedures to implement our laws. Uh, this is by our regional action plan on IYIP. So our members working with local governments to increase to in, uh, strengthen the legal and policy base for land and management. And we have also cluster on land uh, monitoring, which lead our national federation pasture use groups in Mongolia. And that's very important because in Central Asia, one of issues is exceeding animal numbers and carrying the capacity of pasture. That's why pasture land monitoring is very important. So we are using different methods and uh, exchanging experiences among the Central Asian countries. And uh, this year, uh, uh, Rangeland Forum on, on, on, in, on Rangeland Monitoring will be uh, held in September. So this is by our, by our IOIP plan. So it will be organized by our National Federation Pasture User Groups as, as leader of this cluster. And we have cluster on on traditional knowledge and gender. So that's very important also, of course, in the uh, uh, uh, women participation on uh, youth participation on rangeland management, very important in Central Asia because different levels of ownership and uh, the all common resources management in Central Asia. That's why we are promoting the participation of decision making among the stakeholders, including uh, women uh, involvement on decision making. And uh, we are exchanging uh, uh, traditional knowledge on pasture use methods, animal husbandry methods in Central Asia, and that uh, including uh, how to support local communities on including uh, uh, improving the livelihoods of communities. Uh, we have this year UN put system submit producer forum and uh, in that forum, uh, we uh, note that pastoralist is producing uh, about 50% of all agriculture food and almost 19 or 80% is done by women. However, uh, women participation in decision making is lower than lower in our region. So we need to consider on and promote women's participation on rangeland uh, management and community-based conservation. So in the, our last uh, activities related to the, to the uh, agroforestry. This is a new method uh, of, of rangeland management, uh, which is combining pasture management and the forest management and uh, increase uh, uh, our uh, 
capacity of land users to implement agroforestry systems, exchanging best practices, and also be uh, looking for the cooperation with the decade of global ecosystem restoration, this according to our IUIIP plan, regional plan. So currently there are some uh, demonstration uh, sites in the, in, the, in, the, in the countries. So we are promoting exchanging experiences on agroforestry. That's also in line with objectives of International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. So in Central Asia, we have uh, of Kappa, have some uh, uh, best practices. We already uh, documented and distributed among the all stakeholders. Uh, they are uh, uh, leading institutions uh, intro introducing and implementing these best practices. So we are uh, encouraging our, our partners in the, to use best practices and share more experience and knowledge among the partners and local partners and national level partners on, on Central Asian uh, Regional Support Group or IYIP. Then lastly, it is my last slide. Uh, uh, in this year action, action plan, IYIP, Regional action plan, we include uh, uh, to, to use uh, best practices on, on on, on by local communities. So the award we will uh, uh, for Pasha and natural resource management communities for their conservation of rangelands, development of common resource policy regime, territories of life organized by uh, several our partners, including uh, Kappa and National Federation of Pasha user groups, regional IUIAP support group for Central Asia and Mongolia, Ministry of Food and Agriculture of Mongolia, and as well as Regional Support Group of South Asia. And we hope that we also uh, cooperate with ICCA Consortium for Territories of Life. So selection of past and natural resource management communities will on the base of their good practice on conserving ecosystems and the regeneration of rangelands and sound use of pasture and the balancing uh, the pasture capacity with animal numbers on that, and of course, improving livelihood of herders and local communities. So our size and the cert size, our prize will uh, and certificate will be given to three and five communities in first year in this year. So in from Mongolia in Central Asia. And the award is announced on from the 1st of August and convened during the approval by UN General Assembly during the con consideration of uh, proposal for IYIP in September 2021 in United Nations General Assembly. And it will be done by online webinar due to the uh, maybe COVID status. So that will end. Uh, we have uh, our uh, selection uh, procedure and announcement. It is uh, shared now in our Google Drive of this meeting. If you're interested, you can see it on, on, on the Google Drive, our shared folder. So we will, uh, this is also one of activity of IYIP regional, uh, regional support group for this year. So thank you. Uh, during my time is short, uh, thank you for your attention. and. If you have questions, we will be happy to, to answer. Thank you, Dr. Khandai. Um, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Sadana, who is the chair of the South Asia um, Regional Support Group. Thank you, Minal. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, actually Hijaba has set the stage by telling the objectives and the entire I'll uh, share my screen to bring up uh, the points which I want to say about. Uh, it might take half, uh, uh, one, two more seconds. I am hopeful I am visible, friends. Yes, Dr. Sadana. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I welcome you for this uh, regional uh, IYRP support group. Uh, uh, we remember uh, Tagi Farber and the wonderful uh, message which came from Dr. Grazia and everybody here really feeling a lot much about. Uh, thank you so much for uh, setting the pace for that. And I'm thankful to Mongolia, Hijaba, your entire team for 
uh, making a new direction for the world. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, my aim is to say a few words about what activities uh, the regional support group at the regional support group we are doing. Building our team was the first activity. That's okay. There has to be a chair, co-chair, etc. Fine. And the main objective of raising awareness. For this, we uh, took several webinars and our aim was to reach wider areas and make wider presentations. But the first major activity that was needed was to start lobbying with the government so that our, uh, our countries, we have eight countries in our region and these, if our, these eight countries only of Afghanistan had already submitted the acceptance letter. So we were trying with our own government and also all of our uh, other countries. Uh, and subsequently, fortunately, uh, Bhutan and India gave the acceptance letters. And that's really wonderful. Others are, in fact, trying at present. Uh, and, and very likely, we are very hopeful. I mean, we can just hope on that. Uh, but they are trying. We are really after them and we are all trying to do it together. Uh, yatra, this word, ladies, gentlemen, means walk. <clears throat> Any walk, generally with a purpose. And uh, often uh, people go for that to convey a message. Uh, Gaurav Yatra would mean a walk of pride. This is what uh, the, we uh, managed to have the pastoralists take a walk and convey the message to people that yes, the rangelands are equally important just as the pastoralists are. They are the pastoralists. They are rangelands because that's what the uh, breeds depend upon. Their yatra continued to places and discussions, presentations, and it also came up in the newspapers. That's how we reach the people. And uh, friends, in addition, there were some research articles done by many people in our group. And uh, we also were serious about making country reports. All our countries, including uh, uh, see, uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, we all uh, desired that we can make a presentation. On 10th March, Pakistan made a presentation and they told several new things uh, in that. Uh, then also we uh, gave awards on the World Environment Day on the 5th June. And there we also uh, had uh, voices from the pastoralists to listen to what uh, they feel the problems are, what they think the solutions possibly are. And uh, the presentation was made to uh, at the institutional levels. This is the Society of Domestic Animal Biodiversity. Our topic we took was straightway here. And then this message in the month of February was taken forward. And in terms of awards, uh, this was the award this time was given to three pastoralists. Uh, and uh, uh, this activity was uh, continued in a little different manner of no planning to give awards to rangeland supporters are people who restore. And uh, another activity we did was to understand the rangelands uh, uh, by chance. Rangelands as a word is generally not popular in our South Asian countries. And uh, many times, you know, we include grasslands, uh, even the land which sometimes they call as wasteland, although that is important, uh, but the nomenclature goes like that. Uh, we want to change that. Uh, and we wanted to understand it better. So for this, we really had meetings, discussions, and really thrashing the issue. And now another important activity, uh, awards uh, have been proposed by our teams, our groups, by SEVA uh, and by Center for Pastoralism uh, with the help of ILRI and also ILC to provide awards to uh, people who work in restoring the rangelands. That is very broadly uh, what activities uh, we had a chance to uh, do in this. And this award for the best practices in development of grasslands, we have planned to give to all our countries uh, uh, a sum of rupees 10,000 INR uh, for that. And uh, also uh, a perform and all these details being ready, the activities are being done. This is 
us, the uh, regional IYRP support group, South Asia, we have our people around. And with that, uh, I complete what broadly we South Asian region uh, could do uh, to, a, to some extent. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sadana. That was uh, really interesting to see how uh, different uh, activities have been taken up in South Asia. Uh, uh, I, I want to... Yes, Dr. Sadana. I want to close my... Uh, I want to stop share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Badripur, uh, who will... Um, be telling us about the activities of the RISG in the Middle East. Uh, over to you, Dr. Bajipur. Uh, thank you, Minal, and thank you, uh, the organizer of this uh, virtual uh, workshop. Uh, I want to show you what is going on with our activities. Oh, yeah. Is it shared? Yes. OK, yes. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, measures to support the International Year of uh, Range and Pastorates and Pastorates at the Middle East and North Africa. I want to start uh, with talking about the Kali Farwar, who did a great job on pasture and range and range and pastoralism. And uh, we missed him, but we hope to follow him. Yes, the journey started to, to me, the journey, uh, the journey to IYRP started with the, uh, the Pastoralist Knowledge Hub and whatever uh, published or distributed and handed out in the UNIA, second UNIA meeting that uh, they, were there, they, they, they approved something about the desertification, combat desertification and pastoralist. We started, the, the day that I understood the issue, I started talking to different people, to different institutions. So I started my work in communication and advocacy to, to raise the awareness and to sensitize the people, the institutions to talk about this issue. And uh, we had uh, also some meetings at the national level, uh, the national forum to support IYRP at, in Iran. This is the, the, the, the name of the people who are the member of this group. Unfortunately, you can see most of the people are from Iran and some of the people are not living in the region. They are from research or the research institutions or international organizations that they have some sort of um, interest to the region, but they are not living in the region. For example, somebody, some of the people are from the ICARDA, two are the people from ICARDA, two are them from the Global Diversity Foundation. In, the, in our region, there are lots of problems that hinder, uh, the, uh, hinder to have a smooth communication between the, the people in, interested in this uh, IYRP. Whatsoever we did in the region, of course, uh, let's talk because the, the communication in the region is very, very bad. Uh, the, because in, in some of the countries, rangeland is not of any interest. For example, in West, in Southern, uh, Southern, South, uh, Southern countries of the Persian Gulf, uh, yeah, or, or uh, G, um, Oman, uh, so Saudi, uh, Oman, Yemen, these are yeah, in Oman or Bahrain, they do not have any, any range at all. So, and the, the other problem is that the communication is between the, the language barrier between the countries. Northern Africa, they, they speak French, in some countries they speak uh, English, and um, this is the problem, a uh, language barrier. When I noticed the issue, I tried to notice the issue that uh, this is really important. So we talked to the, uh, the first days, we talked to the to the uh, co-ag chair who, who was from Iran. He supported the, the, the communication was very good. Everybody was happy with the, the form of the meetings that he chaired, the communication. So after the co-ag, we go to the uh, council, the FAO council, and then to the FAO conference. After the, the it was approved at the uh, 42nd FAO conference, then we, we, we 
we share the issue between the members of this uh, ne our network in, in the in the area of Rangeland and pastoralis. As you may know, some of the people are now present in this meeting, and uh, they are those who have heard about the issue and they are willing to to work uh, to to support this issue. We shared about whatsoever we could we did to have anybody in anybody interested in the area of range and pastures to be informed. And now we have sent some letters to different stakeholders and the key stakeholders at this point is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because the, the delegations of the, the mission to the New York are those who are there to, to support with a yes no vote. And uh, we also organized uh, uh, eight national and first international range and management conference. At that meeting also, uh, people, people were there. So uh, the, uh, uh, Dana Kelly from, uh, from in the, uh, the president of international range and Con conference was uh, attending there. And she also talked uh, about the international year of range and pastoralists in one of the Present you know, in one of the slides. Okay, now I want to show to show that we did a great job, but uh, we couldn't get any feedback. Uh, personally, I I tried a lot to go to reach to the people uh, to people involved in uh, it could be involved in the rangeland and pastoralist or let's say IYRP. So I did a great I I did a lot of job to find the people based on their. Uh, papers. After that, I, all my efforts was failure. So I asked uh, Ms. Uh, Nassan Karam, who is here, he, I, I asked her to work. She, she tried a lot. She searched, searched, searched. All the universities in the member countries of our Middle East and North Africa, one by one, he go to different faculties. He found the names, email contacts, email addresses and communicated, you know, and raise the awareness of them in order to get their intention and trust to work with us, but all were a uh, failure. No, there is a nine pages. I personally communicated the Middle East North Africa uh, FAO office, which is RNE. Uh, also asked them to help us to, to reach to the people in charge of this uh, FAO at the national, na national uh, national at the national uh, at the country level in order to communicate them uh, in direct to sensitize them to to to connect or to link us with those people in charge of rangeland and pastures but all failure and this is the the, the poster of this uh, international and eight inter eight national and first international conference uh, this one is uh, Dana Kelly she she talked about the IYRP in order to inform everyone again and again, reiterate about the issue. And this is one of the, the newspapers website that uh, I have talked and they have they have put something on the website, the, the website about this. So everybody's in Iran, all the, I can say that everyone in, interested in this issue is informed North. And uh, you, you may see, this is the region, supporters of the MENA in the region. The, I, I want to now call a uh, name, uh, the, the, those who are from Iran. Senesla, who is now he is there, and the, the former uh, Tari was from this institute. This is also the pastoralist. This is the Society of Range and Management. This is the Unimod, also from Iran. You can, you can count more than half, almost half of them are from Iran. So at the national, at the national level, very good. But at the regional level, I don't know the, what the problem is. We tried a lot, but we are not successful. And these are the things, these are the posters of this, this virtual meeting that were uh, handed out, prepared and handed out in this international conference that we had. And uh, it's the last slide. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Dr. Batipur. Um, I think it's, uh, thank you for sharing some of the difficulties in networking in some regions that a lot of us are, um, you know, facing as well. So uh, we, we hope that in the future, you are able to uh, get many people involved in, in these processes. Um, 
uh, with that, I would really like to thank all three of you for taking time and uh, updating us about the various activities that have been going on in different regions, supporting the International Year for Rangelands and Pastoralism. Um, I would um, like to hand over now to uh, Sabine uh, Schmidt. Uh, she has been working in Mongolia for many, many years with different pastoralist groups. And she's also the convener of the uh, ICCA working group that has uh, just convened there. So over to you, Sabine. Yeah, thank you, Menal. Um, can you see me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks, Menal. Um, so are we uh, going into a short question and answer session now? Um, or are we um, moving to the, uh, you know, discussion on topics? Um, um, I, I think we can move into the topics, uh, Sabine, because uh -huh. people have all All right, okay. So, yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so as Nahid uh, had mentioned in her introduction of the agenda today, uh, this uh, event today is uh, has also the purpose to uh, initiate a series of follow-up meetings in the lead up to the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. Um, and the, uh, our discussion group of regional coordinators and members of the ICCA consortium, um, you know, envisions that these events will take place every six months from now on until the International Year. And uh, these events, they should further consolidate the Asia uh, Learning Network on pastoral communities, territories of life, and, and help to, to bring the perspectives of uh, communities themselves into the processes and the outcomes of the international year. Um, so they, um, therefore they should also you know, provide a, a platform for pastoralist communities themselves, uh, where they discuss their priorities and uh, formulate their, their messages to the International Year of Rangers and Pastoralists. Um, we have uh, tentatively, you know, prepared a list of topics that, uh, you know, could be the themes for these events. Um, and uh, we are suggesting four topics so far, but we want to invite your suggestions for, for further topics. Uh, the topics that we have uh, uh, thought of so far is uh, climate change and uh, resilience of pastoralists, number one. The second one is, um, youth in pastoralism. The third one is mobility as a strategy for the conservation of rangelands. And uh, number four is uh, national policy uh, for, for pastoralism. So we would like to invite you now to you know, share your suggestions on further topics and also on on the formats that you you know think would be best to facilitate really the participation of pastoralist communities themselves, and um, also uh, Shruti will I will hand over to Shruti. She will uh, share with you a form or, and guide you how you best um, provide your input. Uh, so please also let us know which topic you are most interested in and uh, what topic you would like to contribute to. We envision that from this meeting today, uh, different working groups will emerge 
uh, that, uh, you know, discuss and prepare these follow up events. So thank you very much. I look forward to receiving your, um, your ideas and to work with hopefully many of you in further strengthening the Asia uh, Learning Network on uh, pastoralist communities, territories of life. Thank you very much. And for now, I hand over to Shruti. Thank you, Sugi. Um, so um, I just shared the link to the um, form, and uh, the form should look. Um, uh, so the uh, form is to uh, collect information and collect your contact details, especially those who are interested in being part of the various working groups. Uh, the, the four that we are hoping to uh, create and uh, also similarly organize workshop like this in the future and have more participants, have more uh, people who uh, uh, help us organize this uh, and inform future discussions. So these, this form is only to uh, be able to get in touch with all those who are interested and uh, hopefully uh, once we have all the information, we can uh, start communicating, uh, create an e-list or maybe even a WhatsApp group and have uh, future communications where we include all of you into this. So requesting you to please fill this form um, and, uh, at your convenience and uh, we, we would uh, we would ideally like to start the uh, activate the working groups that are being mentioned for the four uh, groups and also if we have missed out anything uh, we would like more suggestions on the various other working groups that we should include thank you so uh, yes so this is how the form looks like and if you could just um, uh, put in all your uh, uh, inputs here, we would be able to get in touch with you uh, within a week's time. So, uh, Sabine, over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Shruti, for that. Um, okay, then I will uh, give the floor to Mr. Ichanbai again to share with us the statement from today's meeting uh, to the um, International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralism. Uh, Ihan Bai, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sabina. So, dear participants of today's meeting, uh, we are the working group for the preparation of that meeting proposing following uh, resolution of the bookshop to support uh, IUIIP in, in, in, in processes, uh, processes. So the, you see in the screen, the pastoral community of territories of life in Asia, Thales of coexistence of nature and people virtual bookshop on rangelands and pastoralism in Asia. Resolution of the bookshop, that's a draft. Uh, first to acknowledge the vital role of rangelands and pastoralism for human building and nature conservation and support and bring greater recognition to the upcoming International Year of Rangelands Pastoralists, IOIIP in 2026. Uh, virtual bookshop on pastoral communities territories of life in grasslands, ranchlands across Eurasia held on July 16, 2021. The workshop highlights that ranchlands and pastoralism are essential for millions of people around the world, providing contributing to livelihoods, food security, and uh, cultural uh, identity. Over half of the Earth's 
land surplus is rangelands, which are home to livestock. As rangelands are often among the harshest of environments, many pastoral communities have adopted a seasonal migration lifestyle in the central territories in order to increase their resilience to natural challenges and stimulously to sustain natural resources. As uh, late Dr. Tagi Parvar regularly noted, the migratory practices of indigenous people are almost always de facto nature conservation strategies. We are participants of this virtual workshop endorsed the IOIIP initiative, and we are com committed to support this event for the benefits of rangelands and pastoralists in Asia. We note on the importance of IOIIP to increase worldwide understanding of rangelands and pastoralists for the food security and environmental services and to raise awareness among the decision makers at all levels, calling the enlightened and supportive policies to benefit current and future generations. We are calling for the following actions on the cooperation among all stakeholders to support IYIP in Asia. So first, uh, strengthen customer institutions of pastoralists to support their role in concerning, conserving biocultural diversity, advocating for their national resource and land rights, enhancing economic and ecological resilience of pastoralists, blending traditional knowledge and innovation and providing mobile well-being services. Recognize the territorial ecological integrity of pastoralists on their own customary governance system, prevent the fragmentation of their territories through recognition, indigenous and the community conserved areas and territories, ICCAs at various levels. And invest to strengthening the socioeconomic and ecological values in the resilience capacity, such as seasonal migrations, as valid strategies to cope with climate change, SDG uh, 13, to contribute to combat desertification, restore degraded lands and soil, including land affected by desertification, through and floods in the strife to achieve land degradation natural world, stages 15 and the three, protect uh, their indigenous food production systems to contribute food security, stage second, two, provision of necessarily mobile well-being services such as veterinary, medical and health, stage three, and mobile education services with 100% coverage that related to stage four. So support pastoralists in the territories of life before and during the IYIP. Expand experience sharing on community-based participatory management of rangelands by Central Asian Pastoral Alliance, Kappa, and South Asian Pastoral Alliance, SAPA, for the support of activities of local communities, pastoral user groups, and associations to secure their rangeland use rights with equal participation of women, youth, marginalized poor, and on the management of grasslands and the natural resources in Asia. Organize events, hold annual conferences and other activities and support exchange experiences with conducting a special award among indigenous people and local communities by implementing good practices on rangelands and pastoralists in Asia. Encourage the initiatives of countries of the region and the uh, ICCA consortium 
to hold annual conference with the terms of internationally of rangelands and pastoralists and organize a series of seminars in major population centers promoting IYIP with the objective of encouraging the public and private stakeholders to increase their investment in rangelands and pastoralists. And uh, last, support the mobility as most effective strategy for keeping ecological balance between rangeland capacity and the animal husbandry based food production in pastoral agriculture and increase investment in mobile mobility friendly pastoral agriculture and to develop the mobile and distant services for pastoral communities in Asia. Dear participants, that is the draft of a statement from our today's meeting. If you have any comments, suggestions, please feel free now. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Charity. Oh, thank, thank, you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Ikhan Bai. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you. Uh -huh. Very well formulated statement. Uh, so I think we will just take a minute perhaps to, to read it again and um, to see whether participants have any uh, mm -hmm. suggestions for, for edits. Um, uh, so, uh, so perhaps you can slowly just scroll down for everybody to read it or, or that, that's even better. Okay, thank you, um, good. Uh, Sabine, let us know your suggestion. Sabine. If, if you also can write your, your comments on the uh, chat books also, if you have any specific ones or something like. Sabine. Yes. Uh, I had uh, two very small points to make. Should I make it now? I think we have a, a little bit of time, sure. Okay. Uh, one, uh, we should be able to thank FAO for having approved it in the um, conference as well as the previous meeting. So we should be able to say that, uh, thanks to FAO. Uh, Number one. Number two, uh, in one of those points, yeah, it is right in front of us. Uh, the last but one line says, support pastoralists and their uh, territories of life before and during the IYRP. I want to say, and also beyond, because we don't want to stop with that IYRP to stop these activities. We should somehow say, and beyond, or maybe a better language, please. Only these two, thank you. Thank you, aha. Soft will add, mm -hmm. please change. All right. Anything else? <laughs> Somewhere thanks to a few should appear. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sadana, for your comment. Thank you. This is Chanta. Can I uh, can I say something? <laughs> of course. Um, Please go ahead. I'm just wondering. Uh, pastoralists also can produce the the products that can really uh, access niche market, so that it also helps them to continue this traditional movement and then continue traditional production system. So is it too big or I don't know, it just came into my mind. Uh, meaning I uh, just thinking how we can link with the market in the current market system that really, um, really acknowledging or the value in the current uh, production produced production of pastoralists. So thank you, Chance. So this is this is uh, for last point. So the the 
food production mm. in pastoral agriculture in supporting the marketing okay okay and uh, investment for uh, there are many issues marketing primary processing and transporting and and of course marketing they also can include like traceability system which is now mongolia starting so if you want to include your suggestions on last instance please formulate here or just write on the chat box is that okay Shansa? sure Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Thank you very much. It's good. It's I think it's a good idea. Yeah, because uh, uh, we want that uh, uh, pastoralists recognize it as food producers, but in then it is including the food system, which is including, of course, not only producing, but is value added production, processing, um, and labeling, marketing. That all including. That's I think a very good idea. We uh, I try. Uh, you just try this. Include your comments on last sentence. If you have some on on on reporting of this sentence, please write or or or or or in chat box or later on by email. Okay, I'll try, but maybe I will send an email. Okay, good. That's also a good idea. Yes, during the uh, last, uh, during this day or second tomorrow, at least. <laughs> yes, maybe tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'll get back to you, uh, Sabina. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you, Yeah. Thank you, and, and thank you for this two, uh, you know, very uh, worthwhile uh, additions to to the statement. Um, if nobody else has. Any further comments on the statement? Um, again, thanks to Ichanbai. Uh, it's no problem. Thank uh, you. Good out output of today's meeting. And uh, then I will hand now to uh, back to Nahid, who will um, provide us the closing remarks of today's workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. We come to the end of our today's event. And on behalf of the coordinating team, I would like to thank our respectful participants, our guests from co-host organizations of the event, the representative of mobile pastoralists across Asia and the regional uh, presenters, the chairs of the regional support groups from Asia regions and interpreters, technical team and the moderators. We inspired today by various uh, um, stories across the region from China and by, um, by our cultural landscape conservation by communities and multi-stakeholder collaboration and co-management of sacred natural sites to Inner Mongolia and highlighting the various challenges of pastoralists and to Tibetan Plateau on community-based grassland restoration and wildlife ecotourism. We heard that in Mongolia's large territory, pastoralists and their organizations play a key role in managing rangelands and biodiversity. And today they are holding rangeland use agreements for 30% of the country's rangeland, which secure legitimate tenure rights and assign a responsibility for sustainable use to pastoralist groups. We also heard how the emergence of pastoralist organizations based on customary pasture use has strengthened their resilience, restored mobility, provided collective tenure security, and has guided to development of a draft pasture land law in Mongolia. We also had a virtual travel to Iran and witnessed an illustrative story of mobile pastoralist challenges and learned how Senesta has facilitated a participatory process for strengthening the customary governance systems of mobile pastoralists as a legal entity at various tribal levels. And we learned how their collective actions with support of various stakeholders contribute to restoration of rangelands, policy influence, and contribute to reclaiming appropriate recognition of their governance over their territories. In India, we heard the story of pastoralists of the savanna grassland and learned how they practicing sustainable use and conservation and um, conservation and how NGOs, pastoralists, and Maharashtra state governments are collaborating in conservation of pastures. 
We also heard about the pastoral communities in the North Angar Krisistan and learned how they started a joint initiative to revive their traditional practices of pasture management in order to restore and save pastures from continuous degradation. Based on the presentations from the chairs of the regional support groups, we acknowledge the efforts of government of Mongolia to push the international community to name a year as International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. And in this connection, we heard the endless efforts of the chairs of the regional support groups on how they started expanding the network and supporting organizations and governments across Asia. Thanks to those who did a great job at their country and regions and even at global level to raise awareness about this year to have more and more people and institutions and countries on board. Now that we are approaching September 2020 and the UN General Assembly where our efforts will fruit and we call to reach the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of all countries to urge them to vote yes to the proposal of International Year of 2026. And finally, we called for multi-stakeholder alliance of the International Year for strengthening the customary governance system of pastoralists, expanding the community and territory-based sustainable range management systems, and recognition of territories of life and ecological integrity of pastoralists, and prevent fragmentation of their ancestral lands. The task team also will be in email communication with all participants and with the ones who announced their interest to take part to the next follow-up events and thematic workshops on rangelands and pastoralists across the region as we discussed in plenary session. Again, thanks a million for your attention. May you have a great time and wonderful actions to support territories of life and international year for rangelands and pastoralists ahead. Thank you so much. We now over to you. Thank you. Okay, Nahid, thanks. Uh, I, I think we are done with the meeting, right? So we can disperse and uh, we'll get in touch with um, people who have uh, asked questions um, and also. Uh,